Um, so I'm calling the meeting to order for January 30th, 2018. Roll call. Ms. Snell. Here. Ms. Matoye. Here. Ms. Fleur. Here. Mr. Davenport. Here. Ms. Franco. Here. Ms. Black. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Dr. Navarro. Some numbers. I just want to clarify that uh, for the board and for the record that we are addressing one employee's matter, uh, but there are two cases involved. Okay. I just wanted Thank to clarify. You. Thank you for the so clarification. It may seem confusing. Okay. okay. So we'll go into closed session. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order uh, January 30, 2018, and we're going to start with um, the opening ceremonies, right, for the readout. Okay, so um, if you would stand for a moment of reflection and pledge allegiance to the flag led by Van. Mr. Van. 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 Oh. Okay. It's fine. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so I have a readout of um, action taken and, and closed session, and it is. In closed session, the Board of Education took action to approve the resignation and settlement agreement for a certific certificated employee. Under this agreement, the certificated employee resigns effective January 19th, 2018, which has been accepted and releases the district from any and all legal <coughs> claims. The roll call vote was as follows, seven ayes, zero noes. Okay, so um, we are going to start with the adoption of agenda. Adoption. Second. Second. Are we pulling yes. item number, do you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. 15A4. Mm -hmm. To discussion. For discussion. Okay. Do we need to vote on that or we just do it? When you adopt the agenda. Okay, so we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and then we want the adoption of the minutes of 116 2018. Move approval. Second. Uh, Madam President, I have to resign. Um, uh, abstain, please. Okay. Are you resigning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> abstain. Sorry. Okay, good. Because you, you weren't there. Okay. Um, so uh, we have, a, fir we have a, a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, and then we move to the <laughs> Harbor Council PTA report student by board mm -hmm. members. Oh, student board member. I'm sorry, I did it again. Uh, student board members, thank you for coming. I know you have finals this week, so feel free to, and, and most of you came. So feel free to leave um, as soon as you would like to go study, okay? And we're gonna start with Van. All right, so earlier this week, the results from our ASVAB test that was taken by the entire school late last year arrived, and the top 15 scores earned $15 gift cards uh, to local eateries like McDonald's and Subway as a reward. Um, Robin's Nest donated the gift cards, and we appreciate their help uh, in the past year. Um, PBIS team recently revamped our advisory program. Students will meet regularly with the teacher advisor in 47-minute blocks twice a month to review progress. And our PTSA will be collaborating with Costa Mesa's PTA Monday, February 5th at 6.30 by having Ms. Jody Barber present on drug abuse. That's all. Great, thank you. Okay, Alexandra. Um, good, evening. good evening, President Snell, Board Trustees, Dr. Navarro, members of the Cabinet, and distinguished guests. I'm Alex from Early College High School. And recently we just started our Second semester college courses yesterday. So today, yesterday was my first class, which is statistics that I'm taking. Mm. 
So we're really proud and we reminded many students with posters are on campus, letting them know to not forget that college classes started this week. Um, also, last week we had um, individual meetings for each grade level in our NPR, which um, <coughs> Dr. Martinez presented our principal's honor awards to all those students who got it together. And each grade level also got to take a photo for our yearbook. Um, our most recent event that happened was last week, Wednesday, Ms. Galini, our school, high school counselor and Coastline Community College counselors came together at, in our computer lab to help our seniors apply for financial aid, which was a really fun event and a lot, it was a big turnout because a lot of families needed that and needed that extra help. Um, and finally, um, we are looking forward to holding our winter semi-formal. Um, next week, Saturday, on February 10th at the Costa Mesa Country Club. And the theme this year is Winter Wonderland Masquerade. And last year we had our highest attendance, so hopefully we can double that this year. Thank right. you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Lauren Griffin, representing Corona Del Mar. Um, this week on Sunday, we had finals fiesta, so 13 teachers came in on their Sunday evening and students could come and ask last minute questions and get tacos, so that was really fun. And um, we are finishing this week strong with finals and our winter teams are also finishing. Um, our school is rallying together this week to support each other in the wake of our classmates' death. And on another note, we are preparing for a formal and the release of theme in the next coming weeks and speech and debate held voter registration for students this past week. So that was very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm here representing Estancia. So this week uh, we have finals as of other, every other school. <laughs> um, we are preparing for our winter formal as well that will be um, hosted on February 10th at the Arts Hotel by South Coast Plaza. And we are also preparing for our winter pep assembly, which is the 70s theme this year. Um, and our d uh, drama department will be um, putting on Shrek the Musical at Newport Harbor next month in February. And um, our sports teams for winter have all entered the first round of uh, Battle of the Bell for against Mesa, and we are preparing for the second round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm I'm Jalen from Newport Harbor. So most recently. Um, our winter formal is this Friday at Knott's Berry Farm. It's Napoleon Dynamite themed. Our varsity girls basketball team won against Central City High School on Saturday, and they played Fountain Valley tonight. Our wrestling team made it to district championships, and that was at home, I think, two weeks ago. We had a successful senior panorama kickoff in which we informed seniors of all the upcoming events, and then we gave away prizes. And it was a it was a thing. And then our Australian exchange students have been welcomed with open arms, and they'll also be attending formal on Friday. And then our DECA team earned five grand award trophies, 19 individual medals, and 36 finalist pins at the SoCal conference earlier this month. Wonderful. Great. OK. That's everyone, right? OK. Now, Harbor Council. It's hard to follow these. <laughs> Here. Good evening, yeah. President Snell, board members, Dr. Navarro, and the cabinet. Uh, Harbor Council greatly appreciates the fabulous attendance that happened last night at CDM. We appreciate you being there and showing the kind of support that the community needed. The parents noticed and the parents appreciated it. Um, just so you're aware, we know that the priorities of the district include parent engagement and school climate in high priority. California PTA also has those as priorities and they're going forward with it to help make sure it happens within the community. Uh, in fact, they just put out a bulletin showing that um, 
this is the, the, the work that they're doing is focused on this, both with legislation and in getting it out into the council so it actually happens within the schools. Uh, some of the, the things that they are giving us to work on is number one, welcoming all families into the school community. Uh, two, ensuring effective two-way communication between schools and families. Three, supporting school success and student success. Four, empowering families to advocate for equity and access for all students and treating families as partners with the schools. So these things are all things that, that we're trying to focus on and plan on, on new programs and in trying to get funding for programs that are going to support that. We're all going up to Sacramento Safari um, at the end of February. And it's uh, definitely the focus is once again community engagement and how do we get more engaged with the kids themselves because that's the number one priority. It is the kids. Um, we are also going to be March 9th going to have an advocacy forum for 4th District PTA. And Lynn Patterson of One Recovery is going to be there and be our guest speaker. And she'll be speaking on... Um, not only mental health issues and how to help the kids, but also on funding for more programs. So you might want to attend March 9th Advocacy Forum for PTA. I'm not sure where it is. I think it's in Fountain Valley, but I'll get that information to you. Um, Lynn Peterson. Then we are proud to say that we have the results back from our Reflections winners for Orange County. But um, I can't give you their names because the Reflections Gallery is um, going to be held Saturday, February 10th at the um, Orange County Department of Education where they'll display the artwork and 1 to 4 o'clock. Um, and that's when they will announce the actual winners. But I can tell you a sneak preview. We do have um, eight winners um, that would be in first or second place for Orange County. And we have two that will be advancing on to the state contest that were first place winners. Uh, and then we have two that got honorable mentions. So we placed pretty well, I thought. Then we also uh, are announcing our admin dinner on March 21st, um, which is always a lot of fun. It's, you know, administrators come from all over Orange County. It's up at the Grove in, in Orange, and that will be March 21st. Thank you very much. Thank you. What what was the date of the reflections? The tenth. The Saturday, tenth the tenth of February. February. Correct. Okay. One to four. Oh, good. Okay. One to four o'clock. Thank you. Very well put. Um, okay, we're going on to the reports and Sarah. Joe. Orange County, Orange County Department. Okay. Department of Education. Do you know how to turn this one on? <clears throat> okay. Give us one chance. Good luck on finals. <laughs> okay. Um, good evening, ladies and germs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, um, you, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as you know, um, I'm Sarah Jockham, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent over Student Support Services. And um, within that capacity, Health Services falls under uh, my realm of responsibility. And um, we have been hearing for a while now about the flu and the impact of flu on um, a lot of people, the the um, the toll that it's taking, just the amount of time people are out, and even the um, the deaths that have been caused by this flu strain. So um, we wanted to kind of just give you an update of where we are as a district, what we've been doing to um, address this issue, and um, just look at some of the data countywide. So um, unfortunately, Mary Groska, our health coordinator, couldn't be here tonight. Um, She's home with the flu. No, she's not. Okay, that was it. That's my last one. I promise. Um, no, she um, she unfortunately just couldn't be here tonight. So um, so you get me. 
Um, so currently in Newport Mesa, if you look at our data, um, and I'm going to show you a graph on the next slide that's going to talk about this a little bit more, but it really shows that we, um, our student data is very typical this year, um, and, it, and we've, we're fairly stable with the amount of illness that we've had district-wide over the last couple of years. So what does that mean? Well, for us in the district, monthly we run about one 0.6 to 3.4 percent of kids ill. So that's kind of, you'll see that on the graph. Um, and even though there's been increased um, influenza flu-like activity at the county level and even within the district, we're not seeing it impacting our students' ability to come to school. Um, so there's been no, um, no, r no increases in our, in our illness rates and absences. And um, so right now, um, the county's saying they haven't seen a big impact either on other school districts within the county. Um, so if you can look at this graph, and it may be a little bit difficult to see, but um, the colors are so vivid. But um, the, um, the orange is the one that you see kind of first, it spikes way up high. And that's just used as a point of reference is it's from 2009, 2010. And there was a significant health event in 2009 and 10. Do you remember what it was? The H1N1 yeah, virus. Right. Do you remember yeah. when everyone yeah. was so sick with that? So that's kind of your reference point for during that illness, um, how, how we had almost 4% of our students um, like in between September and October out due to illness. Mm -hmm. The other lines, uh, 15, 16 is the light gray, 16, 17 is yellow, and then 17, 18 is blue. So it's, you'll see it stops in January there. And you can see that we're pretty consistent for the last couple of years um, in our illness rates. And then even this year, we are still kind of under what we've been in, in the years past. So mm -hmm. that's good news. So this is an interesting slide, and this is uh, put out by the Orange County Healthcare Agency, and this is overall flu, um, flu reported. So this isn't just um, students within a school district. So if you look, kind of starting at the bottom where it says October, you see it listed by weeks. So that's calendar week 40, 41, 42. So if you start looking at December, weeks uh, 49, 50, 51, 52, and then weeks one and two into January, you can see that huge spike. And that's when a lot of flu happened. So I think that um, if you'll notice during those weeks, that's when schools were closed, right. right? That was winter break. So our students were good and they can get sick till winter break. And you know, our staff didn't get sick until winter break. Um, we're, that's considerate. So um, it just kind of shows you um, that yes, the, the news isn't misreporting it. There is a lot of um, flu going on but we, um, we're just not seeing that impact, and it could be because we were out of school for those couple of weeks. So just uh, to kind of alert you as a board and then also the public of, of what are we doing, and um, just because we haven't been hit with it doesn't mean that it still couldn't happen. Um, so we continue to always monitor student attendance and illness. We always look if there's any clusters of illnesses going on and work with those sites individually. One of the other things our nurses are doing is they've really customized our health uh, promotion messages for school sites. So some schools have done, they have placed posters up, they've sent out messages on school loop, um, they've done um, some phone calls to parents about like, keep your kid home today, you know, th those kind of things. Um, and again, especially in our elementary, although I'm sure our secondary um, could benefit from reminders of hand washing and staying home, um, you know, don't share pens. Um, and our school sites are doing a nice job of um, our custodial staff of kind of wiping off desks, you know, so that kids aren't sharing a lot of those germs. The other thing that we have as a benefit in our district is we have the HOPE Clinic. And um, we do two immunization clinics a year in terms of providing uh, free flu vaccine um, and other immunizations to our community. So, um, and um, 
we still have vaccine available for the flu vaccine. So um, if, you, if somebody were interested, they could either go through their site nurse or contact the Hope Clinic and find out about that. And then um, we also follow any of the guidelines that come out from um, the Centers for Disease Control or the Orange County Healthcare. And then as a benefit in NMUSD, there was also a, flu, a vaccine or a flu clinic for our employees. So um, that, that all kind of combines to keep us healthy. And then the last couple of things I wanted to show, these are a couple of the examples of things that are um, up and out in our school sites or going home to families. Um, you know, just as, as good reminders um, to hopefully avoid the flu and, and do all of those things. And then, um, Finally, you know, I just want to thank the, the nurses and the health um, staff that we have working and, you know, really working with our families and community to, to keep all of us safe and, and in school and at work. So, do you have any questions? That was, that's great. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I just had a Delphi. comment because we, we always say if you're sick, you should stay home. And I know businesses face the same thing, that people come to work sick because they have work to do. But in our schools, we need to make it clear to, to kids and teachers that if they're sick, they need to stay home and they're not gonna be penalized for it. Right. Because I, I know many students feel, oh my gosh, if I stay home and I'm not there for the test, they're not gonna be able to yeah. make it up, whatever it is. And we may say that doesn't happen, but it happens. Absolutely. <coughs> Mrs. Black. Yes, I, I wanted to just comment. I think a lot of the reasons why our district is, you know, healthier is because we're one of the few districts that have an amazing staff of nurses <coughs> and that assistance. have a finger on the pulse that teachers can, you know, refer to. And, um, and they are, quite frankly, you know, v very fantastic for the as kids will say. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think that that plays a role in the fact that we aren't being hit because I know other districts are, you know, they're actually closing schools. And, yeah, so I think, you know, and the education that our nurses do. So, so I definitely see the benefits of that and appreciate it and grateful that we're able to do that. Absolutely, okay. Um, we're gonna move on to the second report. Um, Mr. Lee Sung. I always right. want to say doctor, I'm sorry. I have the honors. <laughs> um, very pleased to um, call up to the podium uh, two of our outstanding leaders who oversee our early childhood education program. We have Kathleen Leary and Michelle O'Neill. And uh, you remember back in the old days, we used to go to school, and our first day of school was probably very likely kindergarten. Mm -hmm. and, and we have learned over the years, over the decades, how important it is uh, for us to give our students uh, the earliest start possible. So that by the time they get to kindergarten, uh, there's a lot of preparation. So that transition is as uh, seamless and as uh, positive as possible. And, uh, these two uh, leaders have done some amazing work uh, over the last uh, few years that we thought would be a great opportunity to share with the board uh, and our public. So with that, uh, we have Kathleen Leary and Michelle O'Neill. Thank you. Uh, President Snell, board members, Dr. Navarro, executive cabinet and guests, we are really excited to be here. Michelle joined us in July and hit the ground running. Um, we work really well together. I come from the, with the hat of being a principal and knowing the academic skills needed for kids to be ready for kindergarten. And we are fortunate that Michelle comes from special ed, knowing all of those preschool. really important, and special ed preschool, knowing yeah. those um, mm -hmm. social emotional skills and how to intentionally teach those so that kids can learn them and come to school. So we're really excited. We've been looking at some data that we're gonna share with you and we've come up with a kindergarten readiness uh, action plan that we want to share with you. So um, to begin with, um, you know, when we think about college and career ready, we really don't think about those three and four year olds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but really the, the education of those three or four year olds, the quality education that they receive really sets them up for future success. We know that if we can have more students come to school ready to learn and have uh, prepared for kindergarten, then our achievement gap is going to come, 
go down. Because if kids come to school without those skills, we see that they continue to struggle and sometimes even get further behind as they go through elementary and secondary. So those three and four year olds that I was talking about, we have them in our programs and our goal for them is to come to school ready to learn and ready for kindergarten. But what does that mean? What does kindergarten readiness mean? It's kind of, you know, when I was a principal through the years, I, I noticed a pattern. Students would come in in kindergarten and they would have problems on the playground. That was the first place that I saw it. You know, they didn't really understand the rules of the even common playground games. They had a hard time sharing and taking turns. And even, you know, the simple conflict resolution became a challenge. And so we did things on the front end. We had second step as, you know, to teach some of those social emotional skills. We had older kids help the uh, younger kids with the playground rules, but I really didn't have any data to support my observations and I was thought maybe I was the only one. And so <laughs> as we go on, um, we know now that we have a tool at our disposal. It's called the Early Developmental uh, Index. And it's a valid and reliable tool that uh, measures school readiness. And as a part of the Children and Family Commission grant that we have at part of Orange County, um, we participate in the EDI study. And the EDI was developed in Toronto by McMaster University um, in 1998. It's now used internationally. Um, came to Orange County in 2009, 2010, and Newport Mesa was kind of on the front end, one of the first schools to use it in the county. And now all school districts, public school districts, use it in every school. And our kindergarten teachers complete um, the survey on all of our students, our kindergarten students, and we have reports that we will be showing you some of that data. And as the years have gone on, um, research supports that EDI really is a powerful predictor. So one thing it's not though, you know, what you want to might be kind of to jump to the fact that you want to see individual data. Well, we don't you look at the individual data. We're looking at more at a, at a populate population level. We do have school and district reports, but really what the data is for is for communities to look at the conditions in the community, then how they can improve those conditions to, to ensure that kids come to school um, ready to learn. So what does EDI look at? So there's four domains, they call them domains, that we look at. The first is physical health and well-being. Are kids dressed? Do they have enough energy to sustain the day? Another thing is they look at emotional maturity. Can they follow directions? Are they willing to help others out? They also look at communication skills and general knowledge. This is, do they have the skills to be able to let people know, both peers and adults, what they need? Can they participate in imaginative, imaginative play? Uh, EDI also looks at language and cognitive development. That means can they write their name? Can they identify shapes, letters, and maybe simple words? And lastly, social competence. And that's how are they getting along with others and are they able to follow rules? Now there's an interesting thing. Um, UCI and UCLA uh, got together and they decided to look at the EDI data of Orange County. And we wanted to know that if a student came in and they were presented as ready for kindergarten, what would that look in third grade when they took our state assessments? Uh -huh. And what they found was that they did a predictive, predictive validity study and they found that there really is um, kids coming in ready, they score more proficient on the SBAC. Wow. And in two areas that really stand out, are the language and cognitive development, mm -hmm. along with communication skills and general knowledge. So with that said, we're gonna talk about NMUSD kids, and Michelle's mm -hmm. gonna talk about that. Mm -hmm. Good evening, can I just, everyone. Do you yes. want us to wait till the end, or do you, can you I? Can. Yeah. Um, just so it's clear, so everyone understands that the Early Developmental Index is not a screening no. test, mm -hmm. it's not an entrance exam, it no. just gives us information to know where we start. Mm -hmm. No one is ever excluded because of any ty type of right. screen. Right. Yeah. Thank okay. you for that. Just want to yes. make sure. Definitely. So as Kathleen was talking about, it is broken up in the four domains. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to show you the percentages of where, are, where, we're, where we're at as Newport Mesa oh, okay. and where we are in the county. Okay. 
So when it comes to physical health and well-being, we're, we're at 80%. Mm. When it comes to our social competence, we're at 80%. Emotional maturity, we're at 80%. Um, language and cognitive development, we're at 76%. General knowledge and communication, we're at 76%. So compared to the county, mm. um, the county is at about 79% in the physical health and well-being. Um, when it comes to the social competence, we're at 78, they're at 78%. Um, emotional maturity, 81%. Language and cognitive development, 70%. And general knowledge and communication at 73%. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does those percentages mean? And what is physical health and well-being and social competence? What is that trying to tell us? So when we take the data, we're gonna also look at the data and broken up in the subdomains here. And when you look at the data, it's, it's kind of hard for everybody to see here, but when you look at the data, there's four areas that I would like us to focus on, and that is the gross motor and fine motor, where we're about 28% of the area of concern. The next area is the overall social competence. We're at about 11%. Um, La the third one is this pro-social and helping behavior. We're at 24%. And last, the communication skills and general knowledge. We're at 33%. And now I'm gonna break it up into these pie graphs just to kind of give further information on that. So when we're looking at the readiness for school, the school day, 96% of our children are dressed appropriately on time and not hungry. You know, that plays a huge factor when we're talking about our children coming in and, and feeling comfortable um, and ready to learn. Um, when you look at our gross motor and fine motor, you look at those two areas, 28% being not ready and 16% being almost ready. So when we look at that is we're looking at the proficiency of how they're holding their pen, their crayons, and um, a paintbrush, whether they have a fisted grasp, a tripod grasp. As our kids are matriculating, we want to make sure that they do have that tripod grasp. Um, and have the ability to manipulate objects. So those areas are areas that we are gonna be focusing on as a district. The pro-social and helping behaviors, you were looking here and you're seeing that 24% of our students are not ready, 28% of our students are about ready, and then that 48% are ready. So what that looks like is being able to comfort another child who was crying and upset, um, tries to help someone who was hurt, um, invites bystanders to join a game. So these are those social skill sets that when we're working on in preschool, we think about that dramatic play center. We're thinking about how we're intentionally working on social skills. It's not something that our children are coming in already having that particular skill set. And that's the importance of preschool, being able to specifically work on those particular skill sets. The next area is the communication skills and general knowledge. 45% of our students are ready. When you look at the 33% um, are not ready and 21% are about <coughs> ready. So breaking that down is the ability to use their language um, efficiently in English, um, a bit, their ability to tell a story. So that's being able to open up a book, understanding that it, there's front to back, understanding that there's words that represent meaning. Um, the ability to take part in imaginative play, like I said, that dramatic play, that is really important because of the fact that they're using their pretend skills and they're interacting with their peers and being able to turn take and those types of things. Um, and the ability to communicate their needs in a way that um, adults and peers can understand them. And then the overall social competence. This is an area in that social domain. You don't see it so much when they're broken up into the five domains, but when you break it up into the subdomains, you can really see this particular area as an area in need for us that we're gonna continue to work on. 40% um, 40 40 of our students are somewhat ready, 11% of our students are not ready, and 49% of our students are ready. So it's the ability to get along with others and their peers, being able to play and work cooperatively with children and being able to play with other children and showing self-confidence. Do you find that there's a difference between if you're the first child, you know, or the birth <clears throat> order that you've got older siblings, or do they come, mm -hmm. you know, are there's a little bit, is there a difference? The way that the data was broken up, it doesn't, um, it doesn't break it up between siblings. Okay. Um, but it, I do want to point out one thing about when we look at all of this data, 
this data is across all zones. Right. So it's not that we have one zone that's particularly low in one area. It's actually, it's across, the, it, we're seeing the same in all the zones. So whether it be at the CDM right. zone, Estancia zone, or Costa Mesa zone. So the data is looking the same across. So now we know what the EDI data, so now what? And two things we can do with the EDI data. One is to look back, and it's kind of what I said before. So we, we saw all this data, and it's not a reflection on our teachers or on our um, schools. It's really giving us some areas that we need to look at as a community. Because, and what can we do better to support um, early child development as a community? And then looking forward, principals and teachers can use that data to say, hey, I see where there's some vulnerabilities with our kids. Maybe we can use Second Step, or maybe we can you know, collaborate with our special ed and um, our school psychologist to see how we can better serve all of our students. So um, what we found, and it's probably not a shock, but you know, kindergarten readiness takes a village. We really need ready families. So it's important that we're empowering our families, our parents, that they know what school readiness is and what they can do to help support that. Also looking at the community, because we have lots of agencies, health services, other things that interact with our families that maybe can help promote school readiness as well. Also, other early childhood programs. Our, we do have a preschool, but only 25% of the kindergartners have been in one of our preschools. So that means 75% have been in private preschools, other state preschools, or maybe haven't ever been to preschool. So we need to look at that um, and, and have communication with all the preschools that feed into our community, into uh, Newport Mesa. Also, the schools are ready. You know, we need to give them um, information about the students that are coming in and what they can do um, to support the, the students. So the children are ready. Um, not only in school, but in life. And so one of the things, Michelle and I, like I mentioned, you know, we, we got the EDI data uh, earlier this year, and we started talking about it. It was the same, t that predictability, predictive validity study came out around the same time George was talking about SBAC, and I got really excited, and we were talking, we became very passionate, because we really feel like this is an opportunity that we need to take advantage and really look at what we're doing as a district. And one of the things we decided to do is create a kindergarten readiness task force, which involves all stakeholders. It's preschool teachers and kindergarten teachers, school leaders, parents and special ed, uh, local preschool provider, but more importantly, all of those community partnerships that we have. We've reached out to Hogue and to the library and many other places, and we're gonna have um, a meeting to talk, look at the data and kind of as a community, how can we have you know, a countdown to kindergarten so that we, as a community, are addressing these? Um. And then the last couple areas that we wanna work on too is we just adopted the a World of Wonders curriculum, which is um, the preschool version of the Wonders curriculum, oh, nice. the language arts mm -hmm. portion of it. The nice thing about um, incorporating the World of Wonders is now that when our children are matriculating through K through sixth grade, they're getting this already in preschool, um, which is very nice. The nice thing about World of Wonders too is it does incorporate that math piece. However, we are talking with everybody else who has adopted the Bridges math program K through fifth grade, and we're also gonna be implementing that particular program too, so we're looking into incorporating the, the Bridges program. What I've been doing since we um, have incorporated the World of Wonders program is I've had the ability to be able to go into our classrooms and really work with our teacher assistants, our student assistants, and working on intentional teaching as well as breaking down and working on that social emotional piece. And I've been doing a lot of not only just working in within their centers, but I'm having um, them video me while I'm doing it. And the reason is, is it goes back and it teaches, it helps them remember what we worked on in those particular mm -hmm. centers with the kiddos. The next um, area that we'll be doing is that we're meeting with our local preschool providers. So both Kathleen and I have already met with um, a good portion of our local preschools and actually going over EDI data so that they know what that is and they're familiar with it and they're communicating to their families about what EDI data is as well as talking about child finds. So each month that we're meeting with the local preschool providers, we have an agenda that we're tackling and working with them and sharing information, not only from us, but then getting information back from them. Mm -hmm. um, and expanding our learning link program. 
um, quarterly meetings with the early childhood teachers and kindergarten teachers. And then the last two is gonna be this pilot program that we really wanna work on this year, which is a parent night for our families. And um, what that would look like is working in centers and giving our families that opportunity where one of us is showing them what can we do at home. I think that's a parent question that a lot of our families have is what can we do at home to work on these particular skill sets. And now we have the data. It's not just about knowing your ABCs and your one, two, threes. It's that social emotional piece too and how we can shape that. And then lastly, um, piloting a kindergarten readiness assessment. Okay. Mm. Mm. Wow, Thank you. I'm impressed. Oh. Yes. Ms. Matoy. I have, I have a bunch of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is how do, how do you collect, how, do, how is the data collected and when is it collected? Is it collected in kindergarten? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So mm -hmm. the data is collected from the kindergarten teachers themselves. Okay. We, we pay them to, and train them how to collect the data and then they're uh, paid per student. It, it usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes per student to do the the assessment, and okay. it's not a one-on-one -on -one assessment, it's just something that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my second one is, as a parent, I would have loved to have had the readiness parameters for what how my child was ready, because I did it on a, you, we read stories all the time, and let's count, and there's leaves, and it was very eclectic, and I hope that as the delivery comes out, it is, the emphasis is on relieving the stress of a parent in is my kid ready mm -hmm. and not creating more stress right. that my child has to be at this level to enter. Mm -hmm. That's most of, most of preschool is in my subversive. There, it's play, there's so much play and so much exploration and kids don't even realize that they're getting the, length, the readiness skills. The, the, Benefit for us in K K twelve is the language will be the same. So if this is considered a trapezoid, it's a trapezoid here and it's mm -hmm. a trapezoid all the way through right. geometry. So I'm hoping that's what the emphasis is. But right now, it's like I don't want to have another bubble of stress going on. No, I know. I, I at, think no, four you know, to a three year old. Right, you know? and I know that <clears throat> parents are always asking, "How can I get my student ready for kindergarten?" So this is kind of an opportunity for us to say, "Hey, you know." Here's some ways. Here's some ways, and, and we'll be giving them, it's called a, a toolkit, kindergarten readiness toolkit that, you know, it's an online uh, resource that they can use. We are also mm -hmm. printing it for everyone who needs it to be printed, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is Floor. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is fabulous. Uh, many of our families um, don't enroll their students in preschools, but they're in daycares. Um, and many of them are licensed and some of them are not. Mm -hmm. What are we doing to, to reach out to those, to the daycare providers who have one to six, you know, and their infants all the way up? Are, how are we reaching those fam, you know, those daycare providers that are licensed to, um, to make sure that they're being able to offer and access um, this information? So we have a, um, a file of all of the local preschools and family care centers and we have sent out invitations to everybody and anyone who wants to attend. If they have a student or children that are in their program that are going to attend Newport Mesa, they're welcome to attend our, you know, it's been monthly or one, once, you know, we just started them, the, the, the provider meetings, um, but, you know, it's going to be monthly or every other month and they're welcome to join us as well. So we've been continually Excellent. to send them invitations and hopefully they can join us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is. Any more questions, comments? Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, bravo. Nice <laughs> okay. Um, community input. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to address the board on consent calendar agenda items or non-agenda matters within the subject matter dis dis jurisdiction of the board. Mm -hmm. Each okay. individual speaker has three minutes to cover I one guess. or multiple yeah. topics and students may not cede unused minutes to other speakers. With the board's consent, the board president um, may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. 
In compliance with board policy and the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board <coughs> is not permitted to take action on non-agenda items. When addressing the board, it's helpful that you state your name and address for the record. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of cards uh, regarding um, the Estancia pool, and I don't know whether, um, when I call your name, you can either speak now about the pool or wait until that agenda item comes up, okay? Just wave, wave to me if you want to do it that way. Okay. Um, uh, Miss... Oh. Well, she's, still got, she's got other cards, too. Oh. Michelle Caston. <laughs> Sorry. I That's all right. probably used the wrong. <laughs> I didn't use the tripod. Hold the tripod on my pen. Grass. Yes. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. I am Michelle Caston. Good, Good evening. I know that most of you were at CDM last night, and you could see that we have come together to grieve. Many of us have come, uh, are, are here, behind me. There are some parents who have also come to join me tonight in this. And the way that we're feeling is that this could be our son, that Patrick could be our son or our daughter. And we feel that there is a piece of Patrick in every um, one of our children. And that is why we are all so scared. And um, our children are scared as well. As I think about this and how we will change, I look to other places. Anaheim adopted something very beautiful several years ago when a child died. It calls itself the city of kindness. I would like to see a culture shift at CDM and really at all of our Newport Mesa schools. Wouldn't it be wonderful to start this at CDM and have us be known as the campus of kindness? Recently, we implemented something great at CDM called King's Crew. It's proven to be very popular in spreading school spirit at our sporting events, our rallies, and campus activities. But what if we were to extend the reach of King's Crew? This new group would be available five days a week on campus, a place where the door is always open to students to have their feelings heard and their fears validated. This is for those everyday worries about homework, tests, friends, advocating for oneself, and academic pressure. We know that it's got to be okay to speak out without being judged. We know that this tremendously reduces stress and, and anxiety. Think of it like a customer service representative or an ombudsman. I see this as a service that we can deliver to our students to help them navigate this tricky time in life. You know, when cities or companies or police departments are in crisis, it's very common to hire an independent review board to examine things from the top to the bottom. And I'm proposing tonight that we do this for our school with your help, the board's help, and the help of our foundation, which I sit on, and the PTA, which I sit on, and our boosters. It could be a culture commission that looks at everything from students in the classroom to campus life and so on. The recommendations suggested could be our start to a new climate at school. One of our neighboring schools, Orange Lutheran, started a movement like this four years ago. The initiative is called Redefining the High School Experience. It was prompted by the huge amount of stress that kids face. Each month, the students meet in groups of 10 with a faculty member or a, staff, a staffer. It's called World Council. It's a stress-free zone where relationships are nurtured. The focus is on emotional intelligence, kindness, and compassion. There is so much more that they're doing that I'll share. And just one last thing. I understand that donations are being made in Patrick's honor to the Semper Fi Fund for members of the military and their families. And also that the Newport Beach Little League will be putting Patrick's initials on all of their uniforms. Let's keep this going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to speak to um, all those great suggestions? Yes. I. Uh, we yeah. were taking notes, and yeah. we'll go back to the school and share all of your comments, if you haven't already done so, Ms. Kassel, but uh, we will follow up on this. Um, and uh, we actually uh, talked about uh, the work done up in Palo Alto. And that was an article that was forwarded to us by Mrs. Yelsey, and uh, I actually called up there today 
to see if they might be of service to us because they've done a lot of this work up there. Unfortunately, in the Palo Alto area, they've had several instances of cluster uh, suicides. And so they're already ahead of the game. Uh, and uh, there are some changes that they made and students didn't like them or understand them. So we want to make sure we don't reinvent the wheel uh, and uh, make those mistakes again. But we think they're probably a good group to come down and help us. So that's what we're doing on our part. I know that at the school, they've turned within first and they're asking themselves a lot of questions as a staff uh, and as the people who are with your kids for six hours at minimum. Uh, and that at some point, once they completed that process, they're gonna turn to the community and partner with you to discuss maybe some of these measures to go forward and which is the best for the school and the whole community. So I know that that's uh, uh, what uh, I have, uh, we've talked with about with the school and how this process is working. Thank you. Um, GW Mix. I wish I could say I was grateful to be addressing you uh, about something other than the CDM fields. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, President Snell, <laughs> Dr. Navarro, members of the board, uh, we've been together for the last couple of days. And, and I just uh, wanted to take a moment to thank you for the support that you have provided to our students, uh, to our faculty, to our staff. It has not gone, on, it has not gone unnoticed. Uh, we gratefully uh, appreciate it. For the last three days, uh, I've stood alongside some really talented people and some really caring administrators, some really caring teachers, some really caring kids, and it's been, uh, it's been powerful to watch. And uh, I just think everybody needs to know how hard the, the faculty at CDM, the administration at CDM, the group here in this room, many of our parents, uh, and the kids, most importantly the kids, how hard they're working to try to deal with this, uh, this terrible tragedy. One thing I, I do wanna, there's a couple things I'd like to address. I know that buzzer's gonna go off and uh, we'll deal with that when the time comes. <laughs> but uh, as many of you know, Patrick left behind some letters uh, to his family. He, he carefully thought out, uh, at least what he, at that point in time, thought to be the easiest way to leave, uh, leave this with, with those of us who survived him. Um, and one of those things was access to his computer, and on that computer were some letters that his family shared with our community. And uh, that's fairly unprecedented, I think, which has made it really challenging for all of us as parents, as teachers, as coaches, as educators, to try to, to come to terms with that. And, and the problem is in this day and age of social media, they share the letter, folks take pictures of the letter, the letter then goes out, every kid has seen it. Um, but the kids are reading this this letter from Patrick in particular, uh, in no particular context. Uh, they're, they're literally just looking at it on a Snapchat and they're reading it. Um, and I really think it's important for us as educators to, to try to provide some context to our kids as, as they're reading this. And I'm sure, uh, I hope not, but I'm sure at some point you guys uh, will see this letter. I mean, it, 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 it's out there. And, and so even you kids that, that aren't at our school will likely see it and all I, all I hope that you do is take it uh, in the context in which it was written and it was written by a very troubled young man um, who made a really bad decision uh, and, and he made that decision and, and, and chose a permanent path to, to end a temporary issue and uh, we're all greatly saddened by it but I think we have to determine some way that we send something out to help our parents help their children put that letter in context. Uh, you know me well enough to know I'm gonna write a letter to my lacrosse community. Uh, <laughs> that may be enough because it may get sent all over the place. Um, but if, if you don't mind, I'd like to take one more minute. Um, last night at our, at our meeting, Patrick's dad addressed all of our parents and he asked for this to be a time of grieving and not a time of blaming. And, and he was very eloquent, incredibly mm -hmm. strong an incredibly loving uh, man to, to stand up at this time and, and ask his community to, to respect his family's grief and not make this about blaming teachers, not make this about blaming administrators, uh, not make this about blaming anyone. There will be a time to fix it, 
and, and we will all work together to fix it. Um, but the, the last thing that I wanted to share with you is we've been talking a lot about love this week at CEM. And I have seen so much of it from you and from your teachers, and from the kids. Uh, it is a message worth sharing. It's a message worth sharing with the people sitting next to you tonight. Uh, it's powerful. But uh, we, need, we need one another. We've got to get this fixed. Uh, it's not a school issue. It, it, it's not a teacher issue. It's not a principal issue. It's not an administrator issue. It, it's, it's a community issue. Thank you so much. We have to get it fixed. So we will. Your we'll words are together. powerful. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Clay Epperson, you can speak oh, now. Can speak okay. Uh, Steve Smith. You Thank you, Mrs. Now. Snow. Good okay. evening, everyone. Okay. Before I start, I just want to commend student <laughs> services for the work that they're doing. It's, uh, their accomplishments are not always measurable in standard terms, but they're, they're doing really great work. Um, I'm here tonight to follow up to my comments from two weeks ago. At that time, I tried to point you in a particular direction, uh, but I failed. So tonight, I'm going to be a little more clear and direct, and I even have some specific recommendations for you. Tonight, you'll be approving, hopefully, a budget of $9 million which, for the pool, Estancia pool, which is $2 million over what you had budgeted originally. Great news. So what happened? Poor project management happened, as I'm sure you realize now, but between all of the staff and the administration, between the superintendent and the consultants, no one determined at the outset that we needed $9 million to build this aquatic center that's equal to the other schools. So something, some major disconnect happened there. As a result, you wound up with an initial $100,000 expense, a wrecked aquatics program, an irate community, and the tragic waste of tens of thousands of gallons of a precious commodity, precious resource. Mrs. Yelsey, you said at the special meeting on January 11th that you would like somebody to take responsibility for this. Well, so would the taxpayers, and so would the aquatics team, who, by the way, is still waiting for some sort of formal apology from, from anybody over what happened. Mrs. Yelsey and trustees, I'm going to try to save you the time and trouble of an investigation and let you know that it's ultimately it's a superintendent who is responsible for this. And just to give you some sort of example, a few hours ago, the head of the Hawaii Emergency Management Administration resigned. He's not the guy who pushed the button that sent out the alert, but he resigned. The buck stops with the superintendent. You'll never hear him accept the full weight of his position, which brings me to the real problem in the administration that you oversee. There is a crisis in leadership. There's an atmosphere of fear and retaliation, and that is in part why it takes so long for problems such as the math program or the pool or the polls or whatever it happens to be to reach you. No one dares to speak up because they're afraid of being sent to Siberia, so to speak. Laura Boss and Ann Huntington tried to tell you this. In, a, in an attempt to end on a productive note, I want to leave you with the following three recommendations based on work I have done in my career. Number one, I recommend that you can start conducting privacy protected a privacy protected survey of all the district employees without any involvement by the superintendent. Number two, I recommend that you start conducting privacy protected exit interviews with every district employee who leaves and do so without any involvement by the administration except as required by law. And number three, I urge you to stop asking people to sign non-disparagement agreements. That's different from a non-disclosure, two, two separate things. If anyone has anything negative to say, you should be encouraging them to speak up, not rewarding them or intimidating them to remain silent. Until you do any or all of these things, the district employees will suffer, taxpayers will suffer, and ultimately your collective reputation will suffer as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. No? Okay. Uh, Britt Dowdy. Good evening, President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the community and the cabinet. I'm Britt Dowdy. I'm president of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. And I, I want to first off state that um, uh, students are our top priority as educators, and uh, their safety is, is of the utmost concern for all of us, uh, whether it's physical safety or emotional safety. And um, it's been a tough week, not just for CDM, but for some other schools as well uh, throughout the community and, and throughout this month, and we want to acknowledge that. 
Um, I, I also want to just take this opportunity to remind everyone that not only does NMFT represent teachers, but we also represent other persons who work with the social emotional health of students, such as psychologists, social workers, counselors, and nurses, and other prof support provider professionals. Uh, and so first off, um, we would like to thank the board for the policies they've created over time to help uh, bring in better support services for students uh, over recent years. Uh, we want to thank the board uh, for uh, providing the staffing to add those uh, employees to provide better services to students. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Jokum and Dr. De Agostino and Ms. Castellanos for their leadership and giving guidance to training programs and outside community agencies so we can give better support for students, especially those in crisis and in need. And um, something that we had started a, a few weeks ago is, is we started reflecting with um, uh, about what how, how are these new programs operating and how do they fit different employees roles and and what can we do better and so that is something that we uh, started just the very early phases of that conversation and, and we look forward to continuing that conversation with the administrative leadership uh, throughout this uh, period of time and that takes some time uh, to reflect upon it and uh, that was independent of the events that have recently happened uh, but I just wanted to let you know that we are committed to uh, trying to improve uh, the way we do things in Newport Mesa and being part of that, that program and system so that we've got the right tools and procedures and people in place as best as we can and, and do what we can do. Um, as, a, as another reminder, the, on our, our state affiliate, the California Federation of Teachers a few years ago had a, a, a campaign for healthy kids and healthy minds to increase services staff. Uh, throughout all school districts. Uh, you know, Newport Mesa has provided better staffing than other districts, uh, and we thank you for that commitment, but that is a campaign that on the state level has existed for some time. Um, on a separate note, uh, on a much brighter side, I just wanna put in another plug again for February 8th, uh, which is a great fundraiser opportunity for the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation. Uh, it's a celebration of the hard work of teachers who receive grants from the generous foundation that helps kids. Uh, so if you haven't purchased a ticket, you can. And if you can't attend the dinner, there's uh, some other fun stuff before the dinner starts. And then, so it's a great place to uh, give some uh, money to a Way worthy to cause. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, thank Brett. You, uh, Wendy Lease. Um, before you start my time, it's a little bit hard. Some of the ladies are speaking not directly into oh. the microphone, so um, it's a little bit difficult back there before you start my time. Good evening. I'm, my name is Wendy Lees, longtime resident, former uh, board member. My heart goes out to the CDM community and to Patrick's family. I was heartbroken when I heard about it. As some of you know, I teach kids at College Hospital who have a plan to kill themselves or have tried and thankfully have been unsuccessful. It is a, um, this isn't what I was planning to speak about, but um, it is a growing problem, especially with bullying. And um, one thing that can be done is for teachers to realize that some young kids, maybe elementary, have mental issues and need to have IEPs. And that especially the Hispanic parents who do not understand the system, they, we have a lot of Hispanic kids who are in high school or junior high and they've tried to kill themselves. So um, I know you have the program on mental health and suicide, so I'm glad about that. But it is something that's heavy on all of our hearts. Um, I have two issues I'd like you to please review and I'll quickly cut to the chase. One is your arbitrary removal of the, vi of the videos of the board meetings uh, per the ADA uh, Act and um, it's very vague what you're going to do in the future. We hope that in the future our online hosting service will be able to provide the videos and you're saying that because of the cost. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you just uh, awarded a bonus of $34,000, a tax shoulder bonus to the superintendent. I think you owe it to the community based on the standards that are in the CSBA uh, standards. Ensure opportunities for the diverse range of views in the community to inform board deliberations. Well, we need to read, see those videos if we're gonna be able to inform you from the community. Also to involve the community, parents, students, and staff in a common vision. Uh, we need those videos of past meetings. I have uh, written uh, inquiry to the First Amendment Coalition in Sacramento asking them for an opinion. 
I think you've been given a bad opinion by your, your attorney. These, this is public information, and we have a right to see that information, and you are withholding us, so withholding it. So please revisit that and come up with a better resolution rather than we hope. Lastly, um, in context, uh, who, that how could you roll out a program regarding the Chrome books before you assessed Wi-Fi coverage in all areas of all schools? That not all students, and these are West Side students, have coverage at home. That is a bad decision to roll that program out with not, with not knowing 100% that the West Side kids who need help more than, than most kids don't have access to Chrome coverage in their neighborhood. So please look into these two items. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you for your comments. Um, did you fill out two cards, Wendy? Mrs. Lease, did you fill out two cards? Okay. Okay. Hmm? We're discussing. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's it then. Okay, but is it after um, when we go to consent calendar? Yes. The superintendent report. Mm -hmm. Because it says. The superintendent is next. Okay. And then I'll okay. read the consent. Uh, we're having a, a little discussion about when people can speak because it's not clear to me. Um, it seems like there should be, in my estimation, an area before, before the. Um, Consent calendar it should be, be on the on the the agenda before the consent calendar. I'll be reading it. Okay, good. It's not because it's not on the agenda. But you I'll understand what I'm saying? Well, usually, I guess I'm not it, supposed but to have. But that's I'm sorry. what we're talking. Yeah, that's about. that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but mm -hmm. if you if you look, Don't I know I'm not supposed to have a conversation. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk to Mr. Lee Sung. Because uh, when uh, you read when you read the um, the statement, it says that these um, these comments are on consent or non-agenda items. Mm -hmm. And so, if you went strictly by the agenda, you would only get three minutes for either or. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, that's what it. We, yes, but we, we all. We need to have a we, conversation we wanna, about we're this. Gonna, we need to have a conversation about this. Exactly. But you will get your three minutes before the consent. It's a separate item. It is a separate. We item. No, I I understand. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So. Fourteen. We're moving on to consent calendar. No. Nope. No. 14. We're moving on to the report. superintendent's report. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> and you want to say? Something. No. I, no. I, I'm sure Ms. Dr. Navarro is going to address the two things that I, I hope was so. hoping he. And if he doesn't, then I'll say, will you also? Okay. okay. Well, first, uh, I'd like to start with something positive. And I'm glad I see Mr. Drake in the audience because he shared an email, and I'm going to pull him up here real quickly, oh. to talk about uh, the math program that's being currently uh, studied by our mm -hmm. middle school team mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the information that <coughs> came in today. Mr. Drake, would you mind coming up to the podium and give us this information? Good evening, Dr. Navarro, uh, President Snell, and board members. Uh, I'm assuming, Dr. Navarro, you're talking about the Ed Reports uh, report. So if you recall in our adoption process, uh, we, we work with the teachers to develop a lens to initially identify programs that they'd like to pilot uh, in classrooms before we decide on adoption. Um, and going through that process, teachers do an enormous amount of work and analysis, really in relation to alignment of standards and frameworks, as well as some other aspects of it. Um, one of the tools that they use uh, is called Ed Reports. 
and Ed Reports is kind of like the consumer uh, report for oh. materials mm -hmm. and with a focus on alignment um, and usability. Um, Ed Reports, while it was a decision that the, the team made to pilot those materials, um, Ed Reports had not, uh, not yet analyzed the illustrative math materials, which our teachers have been using for the last six weeks, and ironically, we'll be evaluating collaboratively tomorrow. Um, and their Ed Reports on illustrative math just came out uh, sometime early or late last week and uh, received the highest score of any um, programs that have been uh, currently analyzed by Ed Reports. So, uh, obviously, the eye and the lens of our teachers is on target. Uh, and from here, after we uh, uh, evaluate illustrative math ourselves, we'll move on to the second pilot materials of Agile Minds, which also received extremely high scores from Ed Reports. That's good news. Uh, Dr. Mrs. Navarro, yeah, Floor. Could, could you talk? Um, I think it's really important for the public to understand that Ed Reports is a not for profit, one. Yes. And number two, it's, um, it's provided by, um, it's about, the materials are, are done by uh, teachers. Um, and three, it's, they are available to anybody. Anybody can go on edreports.org, I believe, is the, the, uh, uh, their website. And they can, they, can, they can pull up the information um, and read it. And it, it, takes, it does it by grade level also. So I would encourage yeah. anybody to So it um, is a nonprofit that. that provides this service. Yeah. And this isn't the first time. Uh, Mr. Drake has brought, brought Ed Reports to our attention. Uh, it was used to uh, provide that information on both the language arts and math adoptions that the elementary school teachers went through. So it's a highly reliable source. Like I said, it's independent. And uh, this recognition uh, just is indicative that our teachers did a very good job of uh, vetting the materials that are out there and should feel good about the direction they're, that they're heading. So. Thank you, Mr. Drake, for, for the, the report. Thank I also you. wanted to uh, uh, respond to um, this question about um, ADA compliance, because I think there's um, a misunderstanding out there that we're not held to, accountable to this. Uh, so I'm going to actually ask uh, Ms. Uh, Franco to come back up. Um, we've been, as you know, we've been dealing this now with now for over a year. Uh -huh. You mean regarding the videos? Uh, uh -huh. No, regarding ADA compliance oh. in, com in total. And the videos are a uh, part of that. Okay. Um, so uh, we actually use a, a service to ensure that all of our websites are ADA compliant. And that service is the same US service used by a government agency, which goes around and um, monitors school websites to make sure they're ADA compliant. Uh, so I know that Ms. Franco has a lot of information or some information about uh, what other districts might have experienced and uh, why we're headed in this direction. Ms. Franco? Hi, good evening. President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet and guests. Yes, we have heard of a lot of districts who have received uh, Office of Civil Rights complaints regarding their non-compliant websites. So we heard about this about two year and a half or two years ago. And as soon as we heard, we immediately started talking with those districts, started talking to uh, legal folks. And uh, we actually ended up this school year partner uh, contracting with a company called Site Improve. You may recall that contract coming before you for approval. I think it was May or June of last year. So Site Improve is actually the organization that the Office of Civil Rights uses to do the ADA audits on all of the websites. So for our unfortunate neighboring school districts who have received complaints, the Office of Civil Rights hires Site and Approve. They go and scan their websites. They say, here you go. Here's a big stack of errors on your web page. You have 30 days to fix these errors. You have 60 days to fix these. You have 90 days to, reach, to fix these, and so on. So knowing that that was going on, we, again, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, we were proactive. We contracted with Site and Approve, and we created our own very robust training program for all website content managers. So if you manage a web page on the district website or if you manage web pages at the school sites, you have all been trained. If you are not trained on how to maintain an ADA compliant website, you do not make edits on our website. Um, as you know, this isn't something quick and easy and as simple as I may make it sound. There are still some errors that we are working through and will likely be continuing to work through until this really catches on a little bit more. But there are a lot of districts who have been hit with the Office of Civil Rights complaint and it takes a lot of time and effort to be able to update it. So lucky for us, we are 
on the forefront of this, we're ahead of it, and our um, contractor site proof actually tracks the progress we make because one of the complaints when you get when you get the complaint from the Office of Civil Rights is how much progress have you made throughout this pr this process. Uh, another thing is we had direction directly from the Orange County Department of Education on what to do, how to do it, how they're doing it, and they actually created their own ADA webpage. And it says, if you see any errors, let us know. We're extremely committed to it. And we did the same thing. So we created our own ADA uh, webpage, which is actually at the footer of every single NMUSD webpage, just like our uniform complaint procedures and all of those other required notices. So ADA compliance is something we're taking extremely serious because it's something that, while it's not new, it's kind of new to education. Um, mm -hmm. So we are very fortunate to one to be ahead of it right now. And as I mentioned before, Videos are, videos are one of the things that are required to be closed caption. And another one that we're working on is making all of the files that are on our web pages compliant. So it's one thing for the page itself to be compliant, but any of the pictures, any of the PDF attachments, all of that's part of it. And at the end of the day, um, it's really just the right thing to do to ensure that everyone has equal access to the information. If you have any questions, you can contact our office. I tell you what I know, but our true expert is Mr. Matthew Jennings in my office. He is all things ADA compliance. So either one of us is happy to help you, or if you get any inquiries, just send them to us. We're happy to work with them. So the issue has been thoroughly uh, uh, researched. Uh, we have uh, learned from other districts, and we have not received a uh, letter from the Office of Civil Rights at this point. Uh, we are working through the video issue. It's uh, not as simple as just getting uh, your neighborhood videographer to do this. Uh, it has to meet certain standards, and uh, we will be uh, working uh, through uh, the California school boards who are working to make our uh, electronic system meet that ADA requirement. Okay. Mrs. Matoya? Can, can we have a regular <coughs> update on that? It, the community has, has depended on the fact that we don't do a written transcript of every board meeting because we have it on video. So if we're not going to be providing the video, at the very least, can we have an update, a regular update on where we are in getting the, the videos either placed in, in a different format or how we're going to do that? Because I get that. It should, we, the community needs access. Absolutely, and our office only handles the website um, so, honestly, if it's an ADA issue, our office fixes it by taking it off of the website because it's <laughs> no longer a problem. No, but we do. We are working with them, and we will coordinate with Sherry. We've been talking with her um, through this process on those videos. Currently, as you know, they're available on DVD. I think for a dollar, or you can rent it out. I think it's free of charge. And then uh, we'll work with Sherry to figure out what other options are available, um, depending on CSBA's timeline to be able to host our video content. One thing some of our school districts have done is relied on YouTube closed captioning or other organizations that do the closed captioning. Uh, unfortunately, because we are a public agency, we are held to higher regards than most, and it has to be 100% correct, because you don't want uh, certain words to be mistaken for others, like ship oh. is one that didn't really cut the translation in one school district. Mm. Um, so instead of being a complaint, it ended up being a fun social media post there. Um, so again, we're just held to such high standards, so we have to make sure that whatever we do for the uh, closed captioning on the videos is absolutely 100% correct, and as you know, it would come with some financial responsibility, so we're looking to see what we can do and be fiscally responsible at the same time. Uh, so we are still taping, oh, correct? Yes. Because in Newport, they are not live, so never we're not live. No. They, they've never been live. No. So, so the, the videos are available to be checked out yes. even now. So we yes. are, so just because they're not being live streamed in Costa Mesa does not mean that we don't have. They're not delay streamed it, either. They're nothing yet, but they're taped. So anybody in the public who would like a copy of one of our meetings can come and that get a correct. copy of it? That is correct. Thank you. They work with the superintendent's so office are, on that. We are still being able to provide, we still provide that to them. Okay, so Wendy, all you have to do is come and ask for them and we'll get them for you. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Uh, Ms. Matoye? Would you, Dr. Navarro, I know that there was a recent article in the pilot, but um, 
Would you give an update on where we stand with the Wi-Fi? I know it was a good article. Mm. And I would hate to hold back a rollout of Chromebooks to an entire zone of students because there were children that didn't have access to Wi-Fi. I, I absolutely agree that they shouldn't be, kids shouldn't have to be sitting in their cars in the parking lot to do it, but it, would you give the update on where we stand on that too? Thank you. Certainly. Uh, so um, we, need, we have done surveys in the past about uh, how much Wi-Fi is integrated throughout our community and through our students. We are just completing another one that will give us more updated information. Um, the decision we make will be based on what type of infrastructure we have to build to provide signals to students. One of the things that you don't want to do, if at all possible, and we may not be able to overcome this, but one of, one of our goals, and this is a lofty goal, is to not go through a service provider like uh, uh, Time Warner, or Time Warner, or whatever, because they control the speed. Oh, okay, right. and if they choose to give Netflix more speed than the school district, then some really complex content may not be able to get through for students who are in AP classes or in uh, engineering classes. They wouldn't have the same filters we have either. Right? They don't have our filters. Yeah, either. we so don't want. So that's them. the other high bar we're trying to meet: is can we use our system and not have them go through a, a commercial system? Because our our filter protects them. So the, the, the issues that our staff in, is, 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 is looking at is what is the most cost affordable and the most effective way to send a strong signal that goes through our system. We may not be able to overcome all of that, okay? And then how many of our students actually do not have connection at home? Um, I will tell you that uh, uh, most districts are finding that uh, many families have connections. But what our staff will tell you is that, that whatever number we get, some of those families don't want a connection for their kids. So we have to deal mm -hmm. with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the question is, you know, what's the, be the best system? The, the, the radio frequency system sounds really promising. Uh, <coughs> but according to uh, Mr. Bobovich, we may have to put out a thousand antennas to make it work. Okay. And you have to compare that cost to what you could do with other strategies depending on the numbers you have. So it's not an easy fix. Uh, we did not roll out the Chromebooks uh, 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 with, because uh, we knew we would tackle this later once, once they had the technology in their hands. Uh, we rolled out the Chromebooks because they're an instructional tool in the classroom first, okay? Uh, and that's where mm -hmm. they are the most effective. We do recognize that the next issue is how do we get Wi-Fi to everybody that's consistent, that's reliable, and that protects kids. That, those are our three goals. Those are high bars. Uh, I may come back to you and say, we're not able to meet all those bars, but this is the best way to get Wi-Fi to all those students now. At home. At home. Because they have it at school. They have it at school. Um, and, and now they have the tools at school. Right, right. But okay. I, no, one, no one's going to say that that's not something we need oh, to provide. Right. Everybody's right. known that all along. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not required by law to provide it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the right thing. The only, the only way you're required to provide a Wi-Fi to a student is if you lease them a Chromebook. <coughs> and oh. then you're required to provide them with Wi-Fi connection. Mm -hmm. We give the, the Chromebook. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, that okay. does not ab abolish our, 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 our duty to provide them with the connection so that all kids have the same mm -hmm. opportunity. So we're working on this. It's going to be very uh, well researched. Uh, you know, Mr. Bovich, he doesn't do anything mm -hmm. without under, you know, looking under right. every single speck of research every he could find. Uh, you will get a, a, a recommendation from him when he's ready to come in, and uh, we will move forward. And hopefully, it'll be the most uh, expedient process that meets those three goals. His department swamped. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, just so you know, uh, he distributed 4,600 Chromebooks in the Newport Harbor zone this year. Wow. Okay. That's so uh, he's looking at about, uh, and then when you add the thousand that are going to go in into high schools the following year, because you know we do ninth grade the following year, he's looking at about 6,000 a year that he's going to be putting out. So uh, we really, we really are adding a tool that 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 is working well in the classroom, and we know that we can improve that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, are you done with your... I, I, unless there are any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
So I assume that your decision to not go with an ISP is due to the net neutrality repeal and their ability to throttle egg, egg, well, signals? You're ahead of right. me. Right. <laughs> so I understand the Senate may soon be voting to block the repeal of net neutrality. Are you planning to put off the decision on how to provide Wi-Fi to the students until that vote goes through? Well, that's one consideration. The other consideration is our filter. Right. Uh, for commercial providers aren't going to protect children the way we can protect them through our filters. Uh, but you, you're right, th that would be great. Um, there are even some states who are writing their own rules that will uh, uh, prevent uh, the slowdown of speeds to any provider that works in their state. I think uh, Ohio is the first state to do this. Mm -hmm. So e even states might try to manage that. Um, we just want to make sure that you know it's, set, it's fast, as fast as ours, that it's as reliable as ours, and that it is fil our filters on it. Those are our goals. Now, again, I don't know if we can meet all those goals right. uh, when it comes down to it. And do you think that it might be okay to leave the filtering and the protection to the parents as the Chromebooks will be used at home under their supervision rather um, than leave it to the you filters? Know, uh, and, I'll, and I'll be practical with you. Uh, uh, one of the options would be to give one of those little uh, Wi-Fi modulars, uh, modules that uh, just attach to the Chromebook. Right. And in that case, uh, parents would have to sign a document that says they take responsibility for mm. whatever access they provide their student and whatever websites. We can't protect them if that were the way we we're supposed to, to go to, to give them the data connection. Uh, so yeah, we would have to to, to tell parents, you know, that this is this is this. If you, you if we provide you the connection, then you're you're going to have to relieve of, us of the of that responsibility. Mm. That's what I like about our filtering system. It right. mm -hmm. protects kids. Mm -hmm. It's robust. It's easy to connect to everything the students need. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for comments. Okay, consent calendar. Consent calendar. Okay, all items listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the, to the time the board votes on the motion unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. Pulled items will be moved to the discussion action calendar. Okay, so do we pull this item? Well, it's uh, there are five items under 15B. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't pull all of them un unless there's a specific one. It's 15B. Yeah, but there are five Which items one? under there. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Which one? What? B1. 15B1. Hanover Research. Okay, so we'll pull that to discussion. Um, I just have a comment on 15A1 and 2 um, and 3, <laughs> but it's a brief comment. They're all, because they're all kind of tied together. Um, A1, I, I really appreciate it in the explanation that you put in um, that the um, Costa Mesa High School administrative and athletic staff was met you met with them, that was great that, that that was put in there. I think it helped us all know that um, they had been contacted and met with. Um, with 15A2 and A3, um, I wanted to be assured that uh, we would see a, um, a design uh, before it went to DSA. Of what, the, the, the scoreboard or the uh, scoreboard? The scoreboard or the of the security fencing and renovations um, Oh, at Back Bay Montevista. Yeah. The Back Bay Montevista. Yeah. With, with regard to 15A2, uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, what you see attached to the proposal that the architect provided us is the location in the field where the scoreboard will go. Yeah, I that saw that. Yellow spot. That little yeah, yellow I saw spot. That. Uh, because it's our standard scoreboard and all it will have other than the standard scoreboard is two posts to hold it up in the ground, there's not much else to design. There's also uh, something in there about uh, the um, path of ADA. the path, the ADA path, and, I, and that's kind of what, what I want. Yeah, what it's talking about there is, uh, thank goodness, uh, scoreboards are now controlled wirelessly, uh -huh. so we do not need to provide what they state in their proposal is oh. we don't need to provide an ADA pathway because we have a wireless scoreboard controller, and they can control it from 
usually it's behind home plate. Someone is sitting there uh, doing the sport keeping um, okay. that already has ADA compliant path of travel. Oh, okay. So, it so it really is a very simple project. And okay. That's why on this particular one project, uh, staff recommended and I agreed that it made sense uh, to go ahead with the whole project at one time. Normally, as we talked before, we will be bringing you schematic designs. There's just not much to draw here. Okay, so and that's reflected. And it goes to DSA because of the of yeah, because of the poles. poles. If it's above eight feet high, uh, DSA is required because of the structural and a seismic event. Okay, I'd still like to see it. <laughs> well, we can get it. To okay, you. does it look just like the Newport Harbor softball? One? Yes, we can actually we can get you a, a cut sheet on the scoreboard right away. That's okay. easy. Okay. Uh, if that's what you're most interested, in, because again, the rest of it will be designs for a hole in the ground with reinforcing steel and a couple of posts sticking okay. up out of it. And the location, as you said, has right been there. discussed with. Has already been discussed said. with the site. That and, was very and that's helpful. That's the yellow line, as okay. Ms. Matoya mentioned. So A3. Uh, we will see yes. that. Yes, you okay. will. On A3, uh, this is one of the ones very similar to what we did with the fencing right. uh, at the other schools where you will see a schematic design before Perfect. we move ahead with okay. uh, the next design phases. Perfect. Okay. I so. Look and then what, what it's got now. Anybody? Nope. I have a first and a second. Um, do we have a first? <laughs> so moved. Second. Okay. Uh, oh, um, with the, we pulled one of the items. We pulled two. Two. And I believe you have one that you're pulling that one also, right? So it's 15A4. Um, well, so we, move, we pulled four. 15 b so move, Moving it as amended. Oh, B. Okay. Right. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, wonderful. So moving on to the discussion action calendar. Um, Tim Holcomb? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh -huh. President Snell. Appreciate it. Well, um, I'm very glad to uh, be bringing you this item at this meeting uh, because when we, when we last met and discussed this, uh, we actually thought that it might take us two meetings uh, to come mm -hmm. back to you with a, mm -hmm. a, a full recommendation, but our team got together and after going through the discussion, we felt very strongly that uh, we were ready to go and uh, two weeks is two weeks. Let's, mm -hmm. let's keep things moving. Yes. So, uh, we are here tonight to, to give you a, a brief update on it and to ask you to approve the change in budget uh, from $7 million for the total project to $9 million. The big significance in that, uh, remember, is that uh, in the discussion that, that you had a few weeks back, you asked us to include the full scope of that project, which is very different than what's happened at the other high schools. At the other high schools, we've ultimately achieved full build out of the entire aquatic center uh, complex over a period of years. Uh, mm -hmm. and, in the, and what was in the original budget did not include, say for example, the shade structures. Mm -hmm. You said, let's include the whole thing mm -hmm. in this budget. So that's what we've done. Uh, the, the cost estimator has gone back and looked. The numbers are really basically the same as they were uh, at our last presentation for the project. Uh, and we have added about a 10% contingency that is uh, strictly ours so that, um, so that so if, if we get to that place and we're looking to bid and, and we're a little bit over, we know that we have the money set aside uh, for the project. And based on the conversations we were having before, uh, that seemed to be a prudent option. And so that's what I'm recommending to you tonight uh, with a $9 million budget. Uh, if you chose to give us direction otherwise, you know, uh, uh, we would address that, but that's, mm -hmm. that was our plan. So uh, that's where you see the $9 million budget includes the, the, the pool, uh, all of the, the renovations to the, uh, the existing locker rooms, et cetera, to provide for a team room, uh, scoreboards, uh, bleachers, uh, and the uh, shade structures for the facility for $9 million. Mr. Campbell is here and could address any questions that you have about our budgeting. Uh, in that process, we also talked significantly about the uh, schedule to complete the project. And um, in that, we determined that to be ready for the uh, fall swim season of 2019, which was our goal, it's what we've been talking about for some time, 
that uh, the design build procurement strategy was the, the way that we needed to go to get there. Uh, design bid build takes a bit longer. Uh, it also, uh, as I mentioned in our last discussion, is longer until we have cost certainty. And so to, to make it by August of 2019, we would put out an RFQ within the next couple of months uh, and we would have those responses back and our goal is to be able to get a decision uh, on a proposer uh, and the price before uh, we all leave for summer. Uh, this in late June, thereabouts, one of those meetings. So that's what we're aiming for uh, with that design build strategy. Design bid build wouldn't give us uh, budget certainty until about this time next year. So it really is about six months earlier that we know for sure that we would be on budget. Now I also recall that you had a lot of questions, appropriate <laughs> questions about, about design build. And uh, the district's uh, legal counsel and construction matters uh, has been Mr. John Dacey of Bergman Dacey Goldsmith Law Firm mm -hmm. uh, for many years. Uh, Mr. Dacey uh, met with us. We talked about uh, the questions that you had. And he's here tonight to, um, to engage in whatever dialogue you would like to have. Uh, about that strategy. Mr. Dacey, I've known him for many years. He was involved uh, with the drafting of the initial legislation. Uh, and how long ago was that, Mr. Dacey? About 17, 18 years ago. About 17, 18 years ago. Uh, and for a long time, the state of California uh, in legislation only allowed us to use it for projects of about $10 million and more. It's only been within the last two to three years that the legislature changed the law to allow us to use it on projects down uh, to a million dollars. Mm. We still can't use it less than a million dollars under the current legislation. Um, but Mr. Dacey, both in writing it and in using it many, many times, uh, can address and has addressed with us uh, many of the types of uh, strategies that should be used to make sure that we're getting the best value that we possibly can. Uh, I remember uh, a comment that Ms. Yelsey made to make sure we're getting the full value uh, and, and that we don't allow contractors to give us some. We want it for the lowest price, but we don't want something cheaper Substandard. than what we want. So we've also had a meeting this last week uh, with the uh, architectural firm that was helping us with the scoping document. And we've gone through that with Mr. Dacey and with Mr. Campbell. And uh, within the next couple of weeks, uh, we look forward to having that document finally completed. Uh, then we'll have a meeting with the school site to go over that and make sure that every I has been dotted and every T has been crossed with regard to the expectations of what's in the pool and the things that we need to tell the design builder about. That's generally what we've been doing. That's what we've uh, put here before you tonight with the request and the recommendation that you approve that budget and that you approve that delivery strategy. But I did ask both Mr. Campbell and Mr. Dacey to be here uh, in case you had any questions for us. Okay, and the, um, on the action item, it doesn't, we would say, um, we would say design build versus design bid build and, and going forward we would decide that tonight whether we're doing design build or design it, bid build it says design design build that's i'm i'm okay. scrolling down to the item to double check oh, to make okay. sure i did write it that way exactly. that was my intent okay. yes. it says design, design build. build i'm okay. sorry I was, but it's in the detail i have so many papers up here i have to pay attention to now absolutely <laughs> it's really i understand distracting okay <laughs> so i i should not talk and just um yeah Okay, Mrs. Floor. Mrs. Uh, Floor. So just to be really clear in my mind, when we go out for design build, we will have we will have parameters or the the document, the scope of the documents will be there. We want a fifty meter pool, we want shade structures, we want coach, we want all of that, and no more than nine million dollars. That's right. 
process will be that there will Actually, be. Actually, we won't tell the bidders that there's $9 million overall. We'll tell them the much lower <laughs> number of, of what the construction <laughs> right. cost yeah. is okay. estimated to be. But then, right. yeah, well, because it's in the, it's in the project here. You're, you're um, right. But then it will be up to one or multiple bidders. Many bidders. Many bidders who will present their best design build. That's exactly right. And they could be very, they could vary. That's exactly right. I mean, exactly in terms of right. the look of look of them, placements, that is some of the placement. A, a little no. bit. I mean, we've I basically think. told them that in order to provide for uh, the ability to see from the coaches' offices and reusing it and to provide for the fire road that's there, uh, there's okay. pretty much only one place it can okay. go. Okay, so moving on from there, are we well, required so to take <coughs> the lowest bid? We are not. Or are we okay? So we can. So yeah. staff and the school and whoever else, I guess, will look at the presentations, the design, and that will come to the board. That's or correct. You'll call As a it, recommendation, you'll call, it, you'll call it down to. As as a recommendation. So there will be scoring criteria, a very formal process. Uh, Mr. J.C. could speak about okay. uh, how he often puts that together, but there's a very formal scoring process. And through that process of scoring the proposals, uh, where there's weights on price, there's weights on okay. uh, meeting criteria, exceeding criteria, there's weights on their financial capability to see projects like this through, mm. experience in, in full product. All of these types of things, you know, are part of the evaluation criteria that are then scored and weighted. Uh, on the basis of that, uh, hoping that we have so many people uh, that mm. there's a dozen different people interested in it, uh, we would typically shortlist a, a less than a handful, probably, okay. of, of those folks to say, you know, these people we want to come and do an actual presentation. Okay. They would come to the, the scoring committee. The scoring committee would evaluate uh, their presentation, ask questions, and score those. Again, very formal scoring criteria. On the basis of those scores, uh, then the committee's recommendation to move forward would be presented to you and we would give you a report that says the committee recommends that you award the project to XYZ company for this in this particular proposal and you would see the proposal at that time. Okay. So, and my final question is, um, given some of the concerns, who all is on the committee? Do we have just our staff or are there um, outside experts? We, we, who are on the scoring? What do you mean by outside? We, we had we had a we had a good discussion about that uh, at our our recent conversation. Uh, there would be uh, people from uh, our staff on okay. there. Uh, we also talked about some potential candidates from within our community who have experience in the industry okay. who would be appropriate uh, people for that type of a committee. Uh, one of the things to remember is we want to get good quality people. We also want to be able to have them be as potential. free free from the potential of any conflict of interest uh, in the matter that we could possibly do. So uh, we don't have a list ready to, dis to discuss mm -hmm. with you right now, but, but it was a very good discussion. Uh, Mr. Halt was there as part of that, so was uh, Dr. Bauermeister. Uh, and Mr. Dacey and Mr. Campbell, as well as the facility right. staff. Wouldn't Mr. Dacey and Mr. Campbell be good candidates? For, I mean, <laughs> we, where, where we, do they come in? Yeah, we, we talked about those okay. issues. Typically, legal counsel is not included in, in mm. the selection committees. Mm. Um, uh, uh, how many out of all of these years of doing it? None. I usually just assist the committee in moving through the process without Oh, ah. Okay. And one of the reasons for that is if there was a protest, I, I should let the lawyer explain this, if there was a protest by somebody, uh, then the lawyer who's defending us is conflicted out of defending us in, in our own protest. So they typically uh, okay. stay at that kind of arm's length, just guiding the committee, uh, in essence acting as counsel to the committee. 
Well, I was going to ask Mr. Dacey if you could come up and, do. and tell us your role. I mean, he, <laughs> he summed it up in a couple words. But this but way it'll be on the record. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, so as I understand it and the discussions we've had, uh, my role is basically to help assist in putting together the procurement documents and the contract documents mm -hmm. under which the procurement and the actual design-build contract would operate to get you all the, the aquatic center. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Mr. Holcomb mentioned, also to help the scoring committee make sure that it is following the process mm -hmm. that's required by the statute. It is a statutorily authorized method of procurement. It is. It has a lot of specifics in it, and one that Mr. Holcomb mentioned is it has a very strong c conflict of interest section in mm -hmm. it. So that's part of the pre-qualification process. It's also part of the process in terms of who should sit on the committee. So I think we're looking for a mix. The discussion that we had uh, a week or so ago also included about 30 day or more time period for staff and Mr. Campbell and others to meet with the end users out there at Estancia mm -hmm. uh, to go over what it is that they're looking for in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, colors and, mm -hmm. you know, setup and things of that nature to make sure that the end user folks, including the water polo folks and everybody else who's, who would be using that pool have input on the front end. Uh, because you are right, we are required by statute to hire a licensed architect or engineer to come up with what they call project criteria or scoping documents. And that is, it becomes the governing document from which the design builder has to design to. The other goal posts are time and budget as we establish it. And it the budget doesn't have to be the nine million. That's a that's a total project budget, not just a construction right, budget. Right. Exactly. So we tell them all that, and then there's very explicit and objective criteria built into a request for qualifications process, and in this instance, to save time and to get into the ground and design done and approved, DCA approved, and get into the ground sooner rather than mm -hmm. the design bid build method would let mm -hmm. us do. We're combining the process into a request for qualifications and proposals. The pricing, which will be a component of the proposals, will be kept sealed as required by the statute. And the various proposals proposals will be rated per the criteria before the dollar, the, the, the uh, things are open. So we see that, we evaluate. Price is one criteria. It's not the only criteria mm -hmm. because the statute permits you to award the design bill contract on what's called a best value basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so, okay, so, so you go out to um, to the athletic director and the of Estancia, and they say, well, you know what, we want um, we want gold locks on our. <laughs> you, you know where I'm going with this. Um, so. How do you, how do you um, put that all together with wants, wishes? And, I mean, we have the scope, but One we don't first, have the yes, details. That, yes. that's, a, that's an excellent question, Mr. Snell, if you don't, if you don't mind, John. <laughs> no, please. Uh, I'm like, yep. one, that was a big, I don't do that. That was, <laughs> okay. that was an important part of our, of our recent discussion uh -huh, because uh -huh. uh, you remember how I mentioned uh, uh, at our last meeting that uh, the cost estimator's accuracy is highly related to the ability to buy it regularly everywhere exactly. and not to have it be a sole source type of item. Mm -hmm. A gold lock would mm -hmm. be something we can't get in lots and lots of places. So not only is it going to blow our budget, and mm -hmm. you didn't put that in the estimate, mm -hmm. but the potential to get a lot of people to bid on the gold lock would be very, very difficult. So one of the things that we spent significant time doing was working with Mr. Campbell to go through his estimate and make sure, do you know everything you need to know about the fact that there's at least three people who do all of these types of things at that level? Have we defined it adequately so we know whether or not we're at this level of expectation or we're at this level of expectation? And uh, Mr. Campbell can speak to it here, but that was the purpose and he was very confident that you know, there were a few things, we were pretty far along, mm -hmm. but there were a few things we wanted to nail down a little bit clearer. So back to the example from the previous meeting and Ms. Yelsey's comments about the, the, uh, the dais. Plastic dais. Yeah, yeah, with the dais, dais. And, and not having a plastic yeah. dais. Yeah. We made sure that 
there, there is no plastic dais in this. Now, one thing uh, Mr. Dacey could do very quickly for us mm -hmm. is, is to uh, tell you, uh, in the time that I've worked with him, he's uh, recently, or, or relatively recent to me, in the design build method, come up with a kind of a two-step strategy, one where they submit, and then also where we clarify with a contractor so that it's absolutely positively mm -hmm. sure before we sign the contract that they're not going to have any switches uh, any switches on us. So, Mr. Dacey, could you speak That's to that? That's why we need the lawyer. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so just real briefly, mm -hmm. it, it is a very popular design uh, construction delivery method. UC system uses it, Cal State uses it, cities, counties, K-12 districts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, it, it started out as a pilot program, has been implemented for use through the K-12 system now in California. And one of the benefits is its flexibility and be, a, to be able to do things like Tim just mentioned in terms of the what we call the collaboration phase. The, the other is that it allows you to negotiate with the finalists and have discussions with them, which you can't do in design, bid, build. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sometimes that will help drive the price down. Mm -hmm. And the collaboration phase is once you've selected the contractor, the, which we call the design, build entity, there will be a price that they will have submitted to you for their services during that collaboration phase where they have to sit down and review the project criteria document and are specifically obligated to look for flaws in it or ambiguities and tell us what they are. Mm. Because under this statute, unlike design bid build, once you provide them the project criteria and you close that collaboration phase, the risk for any errors and omissions in the drawings is theirs, is theirs mm. not ours. And so they have to fix them at their own nickel uh, and on their own dime. Mm. So the collaboration phase really does promote a team approach because number one, we want what we want and we want to make sure we get it on time mm -hmm. and a quality product. We want to make sure we get into a contract with a design built entity who shares our values and our goals because good contractors Good design builders will want to get in, design it, get the approvals, and build it, and get out because they have proposed a certain amount of money for their daily operating costs mm -hmm. during construction, which are called general conditions. Let's say it's 100 days and they proposed a certain number. If they can get out in 75 days, they picked up a, a dollar value of 25 mm -hmm. days, an amount per day that goes to their bottom line on profit. And if they can do that, Great. Great. As long as we were good, as long as we were good with the price in the first place, and as long as they give us the quality. So the collaboration incentive, phase is yeah. a little bit more of an insurance policy. That's great. Good mm -hmm. incentive, uh, Miss Matoye. When we when we do this process and we go through design, do do we talk to the other schools that already have a facility that's been done to look for the was there something you really, really wished you had, but you don't? And is there something that you said, oh, I don't know why we did this, because that was a terrible idea? Just as a check-in, not to ask permission yeah. or say, we have to have your input, but we to check in. I'd yes, in fact, one of the things that uh, we've included in the scoping and, and uh, the draft for the proposal is that the bidders have to, uh, have to put together a statement of how they have addressed equity ah. to the other three high schools mm. so that... Uh, but I wouldn't want to put in something bad because it was bad in the other three <laughs> schools. Do you know what I mean? It's like un un understood. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it would make it equal. <laughs> yes, that, that, that's, a great, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I will look to see what we can do to... Re we, we have felt in, in the conversations. To be informally. It, it, it's a great question, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Matoyer. We have, we have felt through a lot of the conversations uh, with folks that we've gotten a lot oh, of that good. feedback, but uh, I don't know that we've been as intentional as you're suggesting, and I can certainly make sure that we do that. And the time to do it is now, now. before That's we it. issue the project criteria, because right. once we launch them into design, we have to, we do get to check on them. Mm -hmm. at 50% and 100% of each of the various stages of drawings that they will develop. Better. But to the extent we start changing things during that process, they start asking for more money. Yeah, of course. So. Yes. Okay. okay. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Campbell, you'd like to add? Okay, we covered it all? 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Anybody? Well, I want to get to the the comments. Oh, I forgot about those. Um, I didn't know if anybody had any questions, but uh, okay. Um, uh, Clay Epperson wants to um, address. Good evening. My name is Clay Epperson. I'm a parent and a, a booster, aquatics booster at Estancia. And the last time I spoke to you guys, to this board, uh, I asked you to go out and find the money to make sure that Estancia could get the pool and facilities that we need to run the program for the next 50 years. And so given that you're poised to approve $2 million additional for the project, I have to tell you I'm very pleased. And as a taxpayer and citizen, this is a unique uh, sensation for me. I haven't really experienced it before, seeing government, <laughs> local government work so precisely and directly on the uh, issue that I brought to you. So I strongly recommend that you support the uh, additional $2 million funding. And I would add the caveat, though, that uh, it seems like this is a very hot building market, and there may be uh, increases in costs and so forth. Let's commit to making sure we get the right project out of the end of this now uh, and not let cost overruns damage the, the facility that we're hoping to get. Um, I, I, I do want to say, though, that I think you're, doing, you're spending money wisely, that we're not doing it piecemeal. We're doing it right, right now. We're putting the money up. I think that's the way to do it. I think there'll be a lot more satisfaction in the community with the project coming out at the other end. I also think in the long run it's going to be cheaper that you can go to the taxpayer and tell them that you spent the money wisely. And with that in mind, I uh, ask you to support the additional funding for the pool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Um, now, you want a motion? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I move approval of the financing and procurement plans for the Estancia High School Pool and Aquatic Center improvement. Second. Okay. Um, do we need to add something in there about um, just move the about um, build. design build? Yeah. No, it's in the it's, it's, in, it's in the, it's the, in the motion. It wasn't in your motion. Oh, so. it's yeah. it's in this. Approve it's, the use of design build delivery method as the I just want to know if I needed I to include it. it in the motion. Um, it, if you take the recommendation as written, uh, that will that will okay. suffice. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to clarify for you, uh, we will be then uh, giving you some updates in the future. But we will start the process of getting the RFP together as the next step okay. for this. Thank you. And we'll okay. we'll fill you in later on Terrific. what the exact dates are. Okay. So you made the recommend. You're going to make yes. the recommended motion. Yes. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Moving Great. forward. Great. Okay. Uh, then we're now we're to um, 16B. Uh, move adoption of resolution 280118, approving authorization to apply for a grant from Southern California Air Quality Management District, uh, number PA2 uh, 201802, AB, oh, a, am I just lost my? Uh, 293 Lower Admission School Bus Replacement Program. Second. Okay, and Tim, you want is, to speak to that? And isn't that, that a mouthful? Mr. Holcomb? Yeah. The, the, good, the good news is the district has participated in uh, the Air Quality Management District's previous programs and has uh, been able to buy some buses uh, to replace our old buses very successfully in this. So we've done very well and we're very happy about it. Uh, we have six buses right now that would qualify for this. They're looking for buses that uh, are pre-1994s. Ours are actually 1991, so they're very, very close. Uh, our, hope, uh, our hope would be that they approve all six. Uh, based on our conversations with them and knowing what uh, our peers out there have, um, that, that we don't expect that we will probably get all six. But um, we really hope that that might be the case, and it results in us only paying about a fifth uh, or a little less uh, of the cost of the buses. It's Matoye. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a bump. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Do we have a motion? Well, you yeah. did. Oh, we did motion. I'm sorry, we did a second. Yeah. So it's a roll call because it's a resolution. Uh -huh. Okay. Ms. Snell? Yes. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Ms. Fleur? Yes. 
Mr. Davenport? Yes. Ms. Franco? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Okay. So now we're going to go back to 15A4, which was pulled from the consent calendar. And I'm going to go up to it. This is the LPA. Yeah, this has this is approving the amendment to the agreement with LPA for schematic design services for option B of the Corona Del Mar and high school sports field project. And I think we um, we just want some um, more explanation. Certainly finding it. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we were very glad uh, at the end of October to have the EIR certified. And then our next step with the project is to begin design on the project that was approved uh, through the EIR process. And you'll all recall that the initial schematic design that was done for the project uh, was for the one field plus uh, associated buildings. Uh, what ultimately was approved through the EIR process was two fields. Therefore, the architect uh, needs to go back and mm -hmm. to redo schematic design mm -hmm. for the two field because we all they gave us was a basically a conceptual design a okay. layout for it now they need to go back and to provide a full schematic design and finish the rest of all of of the design that we originally contracted with them for so they uh they gave us a proposal mm -hmm. uh, for that uh, i asked them to uh, take a look again at some of the terms of that proposal and uh, you'll see that they have attached a revised proposal uh, in the form of this letter. And um, it's, it's a project that I recommend we proceed mm -hmm. with at this point with them. Okay, and I know the um, schematic was left off, so of the... Of the um, well, yes, it, basically it needs to be redone. So, so okay. what we're paying for here is we're paying... Uh, an additional $58,000 to redo the schematic design because the schematic design we did the first time was for one field with buildings. We need a schematic design for two fields, and it's going to cost us about $58,000 to do that. Just for the schematic design. There's, there's a lot <laughs> of work wrong. in architecture. Yeah. No, but I, well, I don't understand because we already gave them, uh, we already paid them, they already earned. Uh, <laughs> but they did what they got paid but They for. did, okay. So it's to take out the buildings. That's, that's, ba it's, it's basically it's to take to, out the buildings. Yeah. And take well, but it's more field. than take out the buildings. Okay. Recall that the field moves. Uh, so the existing one field is no longer where it was. Uh, that field. Oh, that's right. The field is moving the, back. The field okay. moves okay. back yeah. to the east yes. from where it was. Okay. Uh, basically, it's a start over uh, okay. with regard to the schematic design. And then there's another field. And then, and then, of course, there's, there's the other field next to it. Which correct. is just a field and it's just a field and lights. lights. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I thought the seats were already there. Not on the second field. Yeah. They're not? Well, we, they're all temporary bleachers. bleachers. Temporary bleachers. So both in the future plan, as approved by the EIR, and right now, they are movable bleachers. Okay. And we currently have seating for about 200 right. uh, there in uh, movable bleachers. But you have, right. put the pl you have to put the pads there to put them down, right? Correct. Yeah. So you have to include those bleachers in the um, you have to include design, the pads. the pads. The pads. Okay. And the lights. Okay. Good. That's great. Moving forward again. Uh, so, we, yeah, has it been moved? We need somebody to I will approve I amendment this. number one to the agreement with LPA for schematic design services for option B of the Corona Del Mar Middle School and High School Sports Field Project. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yay. Now we move to 15B1, and we have a comment card from Wendy Lease. Thank you, Madam Chairman and uh, members of the board. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I got. I know we spend a lot of money on CSBA, so I went online mm -hmm. and um, reread the standards, the professional governance standards, mm -hmm. and for the individual trustee and the board, and um, there's the superintendent too, but the board as a whole. 
So it just caused me to look at this expenditure and talk to you a little bit about um, it's for the consultant, I believe, that will help uh, with the LCAP research. And it's a three-year, $134,000 contract from a company in Virginia. And last year when I heard the um, LCAP presentation, even for me as an educator for almost 50 years, it was a little bit overwhelming with bureaucratic, you know. So one thing I would suggest is that, one, you make it a little more appealing to the common person as far as filtering through, you know, and understanding the importance of the LCAP and how much money is spent to, to reach the goals. And in just looking at uh, part of it right here, um, the requirement uh, with uh, the outreach from uh, item, the process for creating Newport Mesa's goals and measurable outcomes is based on the following. And one of those is input from constituents, including parents, teachers, administrators, students, and other district and school staff and community members. And having gone through the districting process this last year and, and really seeing a low turnout at some of those community meetings, I would think that it's time to think outside the box as far as how to really engage the West Side community, parents and taxpayers. Uh, we saw a lot come out for Estancia for the pool and support that and concern about the sewer gas and the science department. Um, but maybe, you know, last night there was a town hall at Pomona School with a couple of school, with a couple of city council people. Maybe having more school-based community evening type meetings, but publicizing them in a different way. So that the parents, we had a lot of Hispanics there last night and it was translated. And I think that that's going to be one way that you're going to see a change in the, the preschool and the, what you're you know, focusing on and in the overall test scores. And also it talks about the standards, um, the efforts of the school district to seek parent input in making decisions for the school district. I think the, the, the guidelines are here, right on the, the, the LCAP description that's on your website and how the district will promote parent participation in programs for the English learners and low income and for students with disabilities. I think we've got to really go outside the box and engage and, and help the West Side schools and the parents get more involved. And, and that will justify this consultant and this three-year contract and I think the, uh, and making it community friendly too. Thank you, thank you for pulling this and giving me the time. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Lease. Move approval of the agreement with Hanover Research Council, LLC, for research and evaluation services. I do have a comment, though. Second. Okay. Um, I think that uh, as those of us who have gone through the LCAP presentations, I think this is exactly why we are hiring these individuals, mm -hmm. is to do this community outreach. Because try as we might, um, our principals do an outstanding job. We have tons of, of community meetings. We've interviewed thousands of individuals, but trying to get them engaged to come out to the meetings um, and yes. asking them to fill out surveys has been difficult at best. And so I think that is, that is specifically why we're going, um, asking for some, some additional support um, to think outside the box and uh, try other creative ways to get it done. Um, because uh, this is all required um, by the state, and it's part of our LCAP, and so I, I, I really am excited. Um, I hope that we can um, get more um, information from the parents on this. And okay. DLAC does also yes, mm -hmm. do. reach out to the west side. Mm -hmm. uh, 59 members of the, of the parent community were in attendance at the November meeting of DLAC. There was no December meeting, and there were probably 30 at the last meeting that Dr. Navarro and I attended in January. So there's a great deal of discussion dealing with the LCAP and um, a lot of input from parents at that time all the way through the year.
I think it's important to remember that this is a scaffolded reach out, okay? Uh, Mr. Lee Sung's team has been doing some research, research basically on the survey because that seems to be our weakest mm -hmm. uh, uh, source of information. Uh, but it starts uh, at the school site. Principals are in charge of working with their DLAC, uh, their ELACs, ELAC. and their uh, uh, PTAs, PTAs, yeah. and their school uh, site sites, uh, school site uh, councils. Mm -hmm. So already, right there, you get uh, 32 times all those parents. And then at the district level, Harbor Council, we <laughs> we use a couple of their meetings to speak to all the Harbor Council. Uh, presidents and we take their information. They also come to um, my advisory meetings where we have parents from all over the district, uh, employees in classified and certificated from all over the district and they collect and, 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 and that data is collected there. Uh, there are incredible numbers of that come in when you put that all together of how many people uh, speak. We also go out and speak to or uh, uh, make an attempt to speak with the associations and you know, we have a very gracious and very uh, positive meeting with classified every year, uh, and uh, it's, 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 that's the type of information uh, strategies that we have. Our problem has been the survey, uh, and unfortunately surveys, because of the way they're run, uh, it's difficult to generalize the findings because there is no control as to whether it represents the entire cross-section of the district uh, population. So that's mm -hmm. what one of the l recent projects that uh, they're working on is that very question is how do you get a f reliable uh, information from parents on a survey without it being over representative of a group that is more apt to respond or participate mm -hmm. than another mm -hmm. group. Oh, Mr. Lee Sung has something to add. Yeah, if, if I could add a, a couple of things. So first of all, we, we, we obviously share in the um, need and the importance to get uh, all of our stakeholders to participate in the LCAP process. If uh, Vanessa Gailey was here, she'd be up here giving you a lot of those details. But if I can uh, remind everybody that uh, when she gives the LCAP report, uh, there is a very lengthy slide of all the um, input uh, that she received from all the different stakeholders. and. Uh, for all of us who know uh, Mrs. Gailey, she uh, is tireless in trying to find better ways to get more and more input. And every year we're trying something new, and I appreciate Mrs. Lisa's mm -hmm. uh, comments that we do sometimes need to think out of the box, mm -hmm. do things differently, what worked, what didn't work. So I want to assure everybody that that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, another dot I want to connect is at the last board meeting, the board uh, approved a contract with um, uh, for parent engagement strategies. Do you recall <laughs> that? And this was a, a parent uh, engagement program that is uh, uh, well tested, and it's sponsored by our, uh, or not our PTA, but the PTA. The state PTA. And uh, that training occurred last week, and I didn't want to interrupt him, but I was peeking through the window, and it was very highly received. So all of our school committee facilitators were engaged in that. And those are strategies that they can use to better <coughs> connect with our parent community. So we're very excited about that. And, uh, and, and related to this item with Hanover, uh, we certainly have tapped into their expertise, their uh, analysis of how we can have a better survey. We are about to launch uh, this year's LCAP climate survey uh, with their input. Uh, but I want to say that with Hanover, it's more than just the LCAP survey. In fact, they met with student services just a week or two ago to identify an upcoming uh, customized research product, uh, project. So uh, we feel this is very valuable um, uh, service that we provide. Hanover's uh, been proven to be a real high quality program. So I appreciate your support in continuing uh, this partnership. Great. Thank you. Excuse me. I thought we did. I thought she did it before. Did we vote? I know no, we, we didn't vote. Second. We have a motion. Okay. I, I apologize. We have a motion. We have a motion and we have a second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we're going to go on to board member reports and let's start with you. I can start. Okay. I don't have lots. Okay. I mean, I have lots, but I won't talk about lots. Sure um, the Costa Mesa High School zone is doing family math mornings 
and I was able to attend one last week, actually, with Ms. Franco and the math morning. <laughs> and it's so much fun. What the schools do is have the parents go into the class, their child's classroom, and they do their workplace studies, which to us folk <coughs> looks like games. They play math games, but it's not. It's part of the practice of the skills and utilizing math in such a way that it becomes more real, and it's fun. And eat, there were many stations, so the children were working on different kinds of math projects, which I asked in a later question, how often do the children do this? And it's, it's like about every other day or twice a week, maybe as a follow-up to the lesson that they were learning. And it, then the, they adjourned into the multipurpose room where our math TOSAs explained our math curriculum, which was very thorough, but not nearly as much fun as playing the math games <laughs> themselves. And parents asked really good questions. And it reminded me, Dr. Navarro, one of the parents asked a question because they do not want their children using the computers once they get home. So what kind of follow-up should they be doing because they don't have, they, mom doesn't want the kids on the computer. So it was the first time I went, oh, yeah, I guess that's, that is an issue also. So, but it's a wonderful way to do it. I know that when Paula Reno did it, they said they had about 200 parents. There were at least 200 parents. The multipurpose room was full. And I thoroughly, I know Killybrook is having one next week, and there's, I'm looking to find out when College Park and Davis are doing it. So it's, it's, a, it's a real practical application and very well received from the parents, and I appreciated that. That's great. Um, I was also a, we have now have Pacific Corral in Killybrook, so I attended that, was enjoyable, and Wendy, Michael, Jonathan, and Peter Pan flew many times over the w last weekend <laughs> at the Costa Mesa High School Theater. Not to worry, risk management, they were not actually up in the air, because that's, oh, that's one of good. the reasons I went to see it. <laughs> they, the, they went to Newport Harbor High School and utilized, talk about integrating and working across the district. They just utilized the green screen at Newport Harbor High School to have all the children flying on a big screen in the back. So it was very cool. And the alligator, crocodile stole the show. <laughs> All done. Your turn. My, my computer just restarted. Oh. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, a, a, a couple, yeah, sorry. Uh, a couple of things. Um, one, a huge um, thank you out um, to our staffs at all of our schools um, for uh, the handling of a very tragic event. Um, and I especially want to thank um, the family for sharing um, one of the letters and asking for them the opportunity to grieve, but not to cast blame, that they will, we will all move on. Um, that was one of the things that Patrick wrote in the letter was, you, you will go on, remember me, but you will go on. And I think that um, we will all do that. We will all do self-reflection, and we will all come together and, and come up with some solutions, so I really commend that. I also want to thank our facilities people for their community meetings, both at Mariners at Newport Heights on the fences. That was great. I wasn't able to attend because I've been down for the count for a couple of weeks with that bronchitis, flu that <laughs> flu bug thing. Um, and also, if we could have the reports that were done today, if they could be emailed to us, um, they were really helpful. And are they going to be put online so that um, our community can see, especially the the flu one, as well as the the the, the, pre, the kindergarten, the pre readiness. Kindergarten yeah. readiness. Ex exactly. Yeah, I just gave uh, Ms. Franco a homework assignment. <laughs> oh, and, and Mrs. Dr. Leary. <laughs> You got a homework assignment. And, and then finally, um, we approved a couple of new contracts today for consultants, and I wasn't familiar with them, and I would just like to have a little bit more information, um, particularly the one on the math um, with Callahan Consulting. I didn't know who that was. I mean, there was no, con there was like nothing, and I was, I would like to see, especially some of those high-powered um, contracts with the, with curriculum, like to see uh, who
who they are, where they, where are they coming from. Uh, and finally, um, just going to give a shout out right now to uh, Corona Del Mar uh, Middle School. They are going to be putting on, to put your calendar That's on, right. they are going to be putting on Oliver as the middle school uh, production this year. Right. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. They've, they had auditions and um, they're all good to go. So there's cast of thousands. <laughs> so anyway. Many boys. Many orphans yeah. and many ruffians. Many boys, many girls, many Better lots, boys, yes. many, many, minis. So um, that was great. So that's my report. A report. <coughs> I attended a fiscal <laughs> seminar at the Orange County Department of Education, uh, which dealt in large part with the proposed governor, the governor's proposed budget for 2018-19. Was very interesting in terms of how is it going to be implemented, and there are a lot of questions coming from different uh, school districts about the implementation of it. Uh, I also attended, as I said, DLAC, uh, where Dr. Navarro responded to a multiple lot of questions, um, some dealing with uh, security at school at bus stops. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and um, issues about homework and assignments, this kind of thing. Uh, he did an excellent job responding, I felt, to the questions. Uh, the parents seemed very responsive and receptive. Um, also attended some PTA meetings <laughs> where they, are they have started their nominating committee meetings and uh, will be reporting this month most of them, uh, as to where, they, where, what progress they have made. So we'll see what happens on that. And mm -hmm. my turn, my turn. Um, I have to, you know, celebrate our Australian students. Mm -hmm. Their presentation. We've been to, you know, every year, and we're so grateful. I think we started having students come, you know, um, probably in 2005 maybe, or yeah, yeah. So I think my editors will figure it out when, uh, when it was. <laughs> but about, ten, about 10 years ago. I it it yeah. is a, a mm -hmm. little over 10 years. And yeah. they were fantastic. And, um, and Dr. Navarro was sharing that he was really impressed and thought it was one of the better presentations. But there was also a rumor at the Newport Harbor zone that, that the district is forcing us to close this that, they, that we won't be able to do this anymore because of <laughs> other, you know. So, you know, I, I think we need to set that out there and let them know that, you know, that we're that's not what we were talking about insurance-wise. And, um, you know, for travel, for student travel and district-sponsored, you know, things like that. So we need to probably clear, clear that up because I didn't want the students thinking that this was their last year and that's what they were sharing with me. Just on the harbor side, not on the... So we got to make sure we, that doesn't go forward. And then also we had our meeting with our student advisory. And so we have student, um, two students and their advisors from all of our um, high schools, all six of our um, four comprehensive and um, Back Bay as well as um, early college. Dynamic group, they're going to be choosing things to work on. Um, and they worked on the um, graduation requirements last year. And they also worked on the collegiate calendar, put a lot of time and energy and research into it, but they understand that it's a, a negotiated item. And uh, so um, they are gonna come with some recommendations. So if you have any input, I was you know, gonna share, I think, um, about culture at the school and see if they may, because that's one of their things on the list. You know, is their concern about other students and uh, um, and you know it always pulls at my heartstrings because that's usually in the top five. You know, and this is my third year. You know, working with the students at the secondary level, <clears throat> and student uh, well-being is always in the top three, four, or five somewhere in there. And and they are they are concerned about it. They want to feel empowered, and they want their peers to as well. So. So I'll let you know what that goes. But if you have any great ideas, there, you know, I can put in a couple for the board. But um, we'll be meeting next you know, next month or in February, and I'll let you know what they decide on. Student board members. 
homework. <laughs> no, they don't do homework, but they did talk about um, uh, the, the one that shocked us on the very first year is that they didn't want their uh, teacher, what is, um, student teachers teaching them. Yeah, it's and that was one of the one. that was the very first one we were like what wait 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 you know? <laughs> that was our very first year and that was on the top of their list and you know and that was a district wide list so that was kind of interesting they so they wanted their their own teachers to have mm -hmm. the majority yeah. of time so I thought that was interesting. Okay. Um, I. At the end of last week, I had planned on, on talking about a lot of different things, but the events of this weekend kind of made for me, most other things, um, less consequential or important. And I too wanna just, I really wanna thank the CDM community, the administration, Dr. D'Agostino, Angela Castellanos, and the team that you brought together over there. I've been over there for the past Monday and Tuesday, and I know they really appreciate it. And I saw Angela today, and she was still setting up a schedule for the next rest of the week, but they're there all day long. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an amazing comfort. Um, I know kids are talking to them individually, in groups. Um, it's a tough thing, and it's a shame something like this happens to bring so many people close together, but it was, I know everyone was real appreciative that the board was there last night. And, you know, as, as I said, we have almost 22,000 kids in, in our district. And our priority, all of us up here, is that each of them be successful. But it's not only academically, it's emotionally and socially. And we know we have work to do in those areas, and we will. Um, and so I just appreciate everybody who stepped in this week. Okay. It was powerful, powerful event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I just would like to make some comments. Um, uh, I really appreciate uh, how board meetings are set up, you know, with time for the community to share their thoughts and uh, and you got a variety today. It was nice to hear from the parents at CDM and. Uh, you know, it was good to let them know that we're can we continue moving. But mm -hmm. there are times that uh, uh, comments are made where people aren't completely informed mm -hmm. uh, and don't have all the information. And uh, you know, I think the board, uh, you, you, we do spend time with you discussing personnel issues and closed. We're not that we're going to share anything right now, but uh, it's important uh, for the public to know that we have high standards for our employees and that we, we look into things, we look into things, but we also look into things because our first obligation, legally and ethically, is to help our team get better, is to help our employees get better. That's always the first thing. And you know very well that if we don't do that and we move on like some inexperienced administrators do in, uh, or have in mm -hmm. this district and other districts, you can't really uh, discipline an employee if you don't follow all the right steps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the surface, people don't know what goes on, uh, and yet there's a lot going on. So I want to tell you that our HR department uh, uh, is doing a great job, uh, and, you know, we move out not to scapegoat anybody, but to make everybody better in their job. And uh, that, that is, and Ms. Matoye well, and I, I were principals at the same time, and that was always the message and continues mm -hmm. to be the message. I was going to say, the message was always to assist an employee to become the best that they can be. That's, right. that's the focus. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. So uh, some, you know, some uh, uh, under-informed comments were made, but I want to assure you that uh, we have very high standards for our employees. Uh, we're, we look at everything, um, but our first, our first goal is to make ourselves a better organization. Uh, and that is, we and we have very talented people uh, that we want to invest in, uh, and uh, everybody brings value to, to 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 the district that is employed here. So we want to keep keep uh, keep you informed and on top of that, and let the let everybody know that that's the way we operate. Um, the other thing I would like uh, uh, just to uh, 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 focus on is um, we have a lot of work to do in the district, and it's not just at Corona, Corona Del Mar. Um, there has been a movement that has started a couple years ago. You know, you've heard me talk about Carol Dweck's mindset, growth mindset, uh, or Angela Duckworth, that's the other name you'll hear about helping kids deal with adversity and getting beyond adversity. Uh, those are 
topics we've been talking about for the very reason that we are now working at CDM. And so I hope this is an opportunity for our colleagues at NMFT and us to come together for the, for the, for the sake of our kids uh, and come together and talk about how do we provide an environment that provides rigor and focus on excellence without causing kids to feel bad about it. Mm -hmm of not being successful on their very first try, you know, and not being punished for not doing well on their very first try, mm -hmm. you know, because if you believe in a growth mindset, you believe that learning uh, or that intelligence is dynamic and that you can get better. And that if you do better, why should you be held for down because your first time you didn't do as well as you should have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, the, that's gonna be the kickoff conversation we wanna have um, not just at CDM, but it all, throughout our mm -hmm. districts. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's very important. And, and I know sometimes we try to be funny as, in, as, as teachers and entertaining, uh, but every once in a while we say something we shouldn't say. Uh, you know, and I'll give you a perfect, a personal example of uh, when my son was in high school in ninth grade. Uh, teacher came out and said, oh, well, we only have one A on this, on this essay, and you'll never guess who it is. Uh, as opposed to saying, and I want you to know who that is because uh -huh. I'm really proud of that person. Uh -huh. Well, that was a very snide remark mm -hmm. that really made my son feel like, oh, you don't think I should be getting uh -huh. an A. So that was very personal to me. Uh, luckily, the teacher was very kind and listened to our com com met with us, and that never happened again. So uh -huh. I really appreciate uh -huh. that that teacher did that. And that's what I found, that as I came closer to my son's teachers, they were very responsive. They want to do the best they can. Uh -huh. And I think our parents are gonna learn that about our teachers at CDM and throughout the district. They're very responsive. Yeah. They wanna do what's best for kids and they're willing to be our partner. And the message that I think uh, Mrs. Franco was discussing is that was my message to the parents at e DLAC. When you have problems with homework or your kids, call your teacher, they're your best friend. Second best friend is the principal, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. Go, and, go and work with them, build a good relationship mm -hmm. and we'll be able to work on this together. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're gonna try and that's what we're gonna work on at CDM and work throughout our, the rest of our schools. And now that we have this really kind of uh, starting point that we get to start over because uh, mm -hmm. of Patrick's passing. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I, I forgot uh, to ask about um, committee reports. Is there oh. ROPs next I'm week. Sorry. ROPs next week, mm -hmm. okay. And the rest of you are fine. Okay, so. Ms. Olson. <laughs> no report tonight. <laughs> Thank you for uh, approving the pool project. Very glad to be in this place, and particularly because as I reflect on what we've gone through in our recent meetings, um, for $9 million, uh, Estancia High School is going to have a complete aquatic center when we were not that long ago looking at potentially having less than a complete aquatic center. No team room, right. no shade structures, <laughs> and, spend, yeah. and spending more money. Yeah. So uh, thank you for uh, your approval of that. I promised you I would give you an update on the uh, existing pool. Uh, let me find oh, that right. little note that uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Marsh gave me. Of course, he's sitting here. He could he could give it to us in, per in person, <laughs> but um, the... Uh, we have gotten proposals from all the vendors that will be necessary to, mm -hmm. to get in. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the different parts arrive, uh, we'll be working with them to get going. There's a couple of things going on this week. Uh, the acid tank and the metering for the acid is getting ready to be installed. They're caulking the joints on the deck and they're working on the pool lights uh, this week. So uh, progress is going and uh, we're encouraged, we think, that uh, uh, with these various vendors, we may be able to beat our schedule. So, so nice. far, so good. May. 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 I said May. May. It's a possibility. May. may be able to beat our schedule. May. We hope. Too. There's May. Okay. Okay. That's it. If you'll, re if you'll remember, uh, about six years ago, Governor Brown uh, ended redevelopment agencies. And right. as a result, um, this district received some one-time funding, which has mm -hmm. been very helpful. In fact, uh, part of the funding for the Estancia pool is coming from the end of the redevelopment agencies. And during that time, I've been um, your designee on two successor agency boards, one for the city of Costa Mesa and one for Orange County itself. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and those, uh, those boards are now, they had their last uh, meetings here this, this past two weeks. So um, I just want to let you know your, your interests have been, have been uh, well represented on those boards and, and that's come full circle now and come to an end. So show oh. us more money. Sure, yeah. <laughs> well, there's, yeah, there's, all gone money. It's all, all gone. gone. Yeah. So yes. I, and I also would like to share some cards with you. Uh, hmm. You know, our, our operation is, is um, a, a classic back office operation, and so we, we really have to um, work hard at making sure that we're substantially contributing to your priorities and to the, the superintendent's leadership ob objectives. And so uh, we have <coughs> got together as a group and decided oh, if there were some things that we, if we were very, very good at, just exceptional that would contribute to your priorities and to the superintendent's leadership objectives, what would they be? And these are the things that, that the group came up with. And so I just wanted to uh, present them cool. to you. Um, it's really great. There's be accurate, form strong <coughs> professional relationships, build integrity and trust, and believe everything can be improved. This is great. Thank you. Did our board priorities. I love it. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Really Thank nice. you. Yes. Dr. Baumeister. To piggyback on what Dr. Varro was just talking about, in three weeks we'll have 16 principals and directors meeting for our new book study at Lindbergh uh, every other Thursday morning mm -hmm. at 6.30, and we're going to be reading Angela Duckworth's Grit, oh, um, The Power and Passion of, of Perseverance. And it's really about uh, resiliency and about how some people can power through certain uh, life events that are debilitating for other people. And so mm -hmm. as directors and as people that are leading other people, how do we help people um, develop those resiliency skills to be able to power through, and for us as well. So it'll be a good study. Dr. Sir. Just wanted to take a minute to recognize the great work that Ray Elementary School is doing, both with, with their AVID program and parent engagement. Uh, Dr. Cox and the staff at Ray School put a lot of time and effort into last Wednesday's um, uh, family AVID night, mm -hmm. and that was in partnership with the Costa Mesa Library, and mm -hmm. they had uh, in attendance, the focus was reading, and they had in attendance over 120 parents, and they were wow. just absolutely thrilled with the way that they were engaging around the importance of reading, the role of parents with uh, helping their child with reading strategies and allowing time for there to be reading, just uh, <coughs> something they're very, very proud of. So they, again, that was their second AVID parent engagement night. The first one was focused on note taking and organization. How do you just organize all of the stuff that you receive when you're working with math? English, social studies, science. So um, they're doing a great job with uh, AVID, and I just appreciate all the great work Ray Elementary School is doing. I want to add a little bit to uh, what you heard earlier uh, this evening uh, with uh, Kathleen Leary's presentation on early childhood education. One of the pieces that she uh, mentioned there um, was the uh, partnership meetings that they hold uh, with our private uh, preschool. And I was able to squeeze into my schedule to actually go and watch that uh, in person. And I was very impressed that they were very much engaged. And uh, they set the agenda, so the topics are very meaningful for them. And this uh, meeting last week happened to be, uh, the theme was special education. So Maureen Cottrell was there and talking about the child fine law and, and how we really have a, a great services here, but more importantly, these services are even available for children even before they get us get, get to us. So I, I just thought that was a great observation to see these meetings in action that she had mentioned earlier. Outreach really reaches out. <laughs> As you know, for the past several months, we've been um, focused in working on suicide prevention and uh, intervention. And um, it's unfortunate that these events of this weekend kind of highlight again what a tremendous need we have in our schools to address these issues. So um, I just wanted to give you an update because one of the things that um, as a board you'd asked for is that we look beyond secondary and we really look at what we're gonna do for our elementary staff. So um, uh, hopefully at the next board meeting, we're gonna be having you approve um, what we wanna do for training for our elementary staff, our certificated staff, to deal with um, 
with young children who have, um, you know, uh, suicidal ideation or they're really struggling and how they can work with them. The other thing that we've been working on, you know, we've trained our secondary staff on um, certificated and classified um, on uh, signs of suicide <coughs> and all of that. And uh, one of the other aspects of it is to um, provide uh, training for the students. And we spent um, some time today as a cabinet trying to figure out um, uh, what that, what those grade levels would be. And then we've also had a task force, I think a couple of you may have even been on the mental health task force, um, that vetted um, some different materials that would be appropriate for students to um, participate in. And so we um, decided that we would really like to target students in seventh grade and in ninth grade because those are big transition years for kids. And um, so we're going to look at how we're going to develop that um, uh, student training and how that's going to look in terms of who's going to present the training and what form that will take. But we are, I just wanted to keep you looped in that um, we're continuing to move forward behind the scenes on all of this. And so if you have any other <coughs> questions, feel free to ask us. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. I think that's it. Um, move to adjourn the meeting. Could we second? Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Okay. Thank you for coming and staying, and see you in a couple weeks. <laughs>